Book Five, Chapter Nine of Les Misérables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zachary Brewster Geis. Les Misérables by Victor Hugo. Book Fifth, The Descent, Chapter Nine. Madame Victorien's success. So the monk's widow was good for something. But Monsieur Madeleine had heard nothing of all this. Life is full of just such combinations of events. Monsieur Madeleine was in the habit of almost never entering the women's workroom. At the head of this room he had placed an elderly spinster, whom the priest had provided for him, and he had full confidence in this superintendent. A truly respectable person, firm, equitable, upright, full of the charity which consists in giving, but not having in the same degree that charity which consists in understanding and in forgiving. Monsieur Madeleine relied wholly on her. The best men are often obliged to delegate their authority. It was with this full power and the conviction that she was doing right that the superintendent had instituted the suit, judged, condemned, and executed Fontaine. As regards the fifty francs, she had given them from a fund which Monsieur Madeleine had entrusted to her for charitable purposes, and for giving assistance to the workwomen, and of which she rendered no account. Fantine tried to obtain a situation as a servant in the neighborhood. She went from house to house. No one would have her. She could not leave town. The second-hand dealer, to whom she was in debt for her furniture, and what furniture, said to her, "'If you leave, I will have you arrested as a thief.' The householder, whom she owed for her rent, said to her, "'You are young and pretty. You can pay.' She divided the fifty francs between the landlord and the furniture dealer, returned to the latter three-quarters of his goods, kept only necessaries, and found herself without work, without a trade, with nothing but her bed, and still about fifty francs in debt. She began to make coarse shirts for soldiers of the garrison, and earned twelve sous a day. Her daughter cost her ten. It was at this point that she began to pay the Thénardier irregularly. However, the old woman who lighted her candle for her when she returned at night taught her the art of living in misery. Back of living on little, there is the living on nothing. These are the two chambers. The first is dark, the second is black. Fantine learned how to live without fire entirely in the winter how to give up a bird which eats a half a farthing's worth of millet every two days, how to make a coverlet of one's petticoat and a petticoat of one's coverlet, how to save one's candle by taking one's meals by the light of the opposite window. No one knows all that certain feeble creatures who have grown old in privation and honesty can get out of a sou. It ends by being a talent. Fantine acquired this sublime talent and regained a little courage. At this epoch she said to a neighbor, Bah! I say to myself, by only sleeping five hours and working all the rest of the time at my sewing, I shall always manage to nearly earn my bread. And then, when one is sad, one eats less. Well, sufferings, uneasiness, a little bread on one hand, trouble on the other, all this will support me. It would have been a great happiness to have her little girl with her in this distress. She thought of having her come. But what then? make her share her own destitution. And then she was in debt to the Thénardier. How could she pay them? And the journey, how pay for that? The old woman who had given her lessons in what may be called the life of indigence was a sainted spinster named Marguerite, who was pious with a true piety, poor and charitable towards the poor, and even towards the rich, knowing how to write just sufficiently to sign herself Marguerite, and believing in God, which is science. There are many such virtuous people in this lower world. Some day they will be in the world above. This life has a morrow. At first Fantine had been so ashamed that she had not dared to go out. When she was in the street she divined that people turned round behind her and pointed at her. Every one stared at her and no one greeted her. The cold and bitter scorn of the passers-by penetrated her very flesh and soul like a north wind. It seems as though an unfortunate woman were utterly bare beneath the sarcasm and the curiosity of all in small towns. In Paris, at least, no one knows you, and this obscurity is a garment. 
Oh, how she would have liked to betake herself to Paris. Impossible. She was obliged to accustom herself to disrepute, as she had accustomed herself to indigence. Gradually she decided on her course. At the expiration of two or three months she shook off her shame, and began to go about as though there were nothing the matter. "'It is all the same to me,' she said. She went and came, bearing her head well up, with a bitter smile, and was conscious that she was becoming brazen-faced. Madame Victorien sometimes saw her passing from her window, noticed the distress of that creature who, thanks to her, had been put back in her proper place, and congratulated herself. The happiness of the evil-minded is black. Excess of toil wore out Fantine, and the little dry cough which troubled her increased. She sometimes said to her neighbor, Marguerite, "'Just feel how hot my hands are.' Nevertheless, when she combed her beautiful hair in the morning with an old broken comb, and it flowed about her like floss silk, she experienced a moment of happy coquetry. End of Part 5, Chapter 9 Read by Zachary Brewster Geis, Greenbelt, Maryland, June 2007《Chapter 10 of Les Miserables》Translated by Isabel F. Hapgood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zachary Brewster Geis Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Book Fifth The Descent Chapter 10 Result of the success. She had been dismissed towards the end of the winter. The summer passed, but winter came again. Short days, less work. Winter, no warmth, no light, no noonday. The evening joining on to the morning, fogs, twilight. The window is gray. It is impossible to see clearly at it. The sky is but a vent hole. The whole day is a cavern. The sun has the air of a beggar. A frightful season. Winter changes the water of heaven and the heart of man into a stone. Her creditors harassed her. Fantine earned too little. Her debts had increased. The Thénardier, who were not promptly paid, wrote to her constantly letters whose contents drove her to despair and whose carriage ruined her. One day they wrote to her that her little Cosette was entirely naked in that cold weather, that she needed a woolen skirt, and that her mother must send at least ten francs for this. She received the letter and crushed it in her hands all day long. That evening she went into a barber's shop at the corner of the street and pulled out her comb. Her admirable golden hair fell to her knees. "'What splendid hair!' exclaimed the barber. "'How much will you give me for it?' said she. Ten francs. "'Cut it off.' She purchased a knitted petticoat and sent it to the Thénardier. This petticoat made the Thénardier furious. It was the money that they wanted. They gave the petticoat to Eponine. The poor lark continued to shiver. Fantine thought, My child is no longer cold. I have clothed her with my hair. She put on little round caps which concealed her shorn head, and in which she was still pretty. Dark thoughts held possession of Fantine's heart. When she saw that she could no longer dress her hair, she began to hate everyone about her. She had long shared the universal veneration for Father Madeleine, yet, by dint of repeating to herself that it was he who had discharged her, that he was the cause of her unhappiness, she came to hate him also, and most of all. When he passed the factory in working hours when the workpeople were at the door, she affected to laugh and sing. An old workwoman who once saw her laughing and singing in this fashion said, There's a girl who will come to a bad end. She took a lover, the first who offered, a man whom she did not love, out of bravado and with rage in her heart. He was a miserable scamp, a sort of mendicant musician, a lazy beggar who beat her and who abandoned her as she had taken him in disgust. She adored her child. 
The lower she descended, the darker everything grew about her, the more radiant shone that little angel at the bottom of her heart. She said, When I get rich, I will have my Cosette with me. And she laughed. Her cough did not leave her, and she had sweats on her back. One day she received from the Thénardier a letter couched in the following terms. Cosette is ill with a malady which is going the rounds of the neighborhood. A miliary fever, they call it. Expensive drugs are required. This is ruining us, and we can no longer pay for them. If you do not send us forty francs before the week is out, the little one will be dead. She burst out laughing and said to her old neighbor, Ah, they are good. Forty francs. The idea. That makes two Napoleons. Where do they think I am to get them? These peasants are stupid, truly. Nevertheless, she went to a dormer window in the staircase and read the letter once more. Then she descended the stairs and emerged, running and leaping and still laughing. Someone met her and said to her, What makes you so gay? She replied, A fine piece of stupidity that some country people have written to me. They demand forty francs of me. <laughs> so much for you, you peasants. As she crossed the square, she saw a great many people collected around a carriage of eccentric shape, upon the top of which stood a man dressed in red who was holding forth. He was a quack dentist on his rounds, who was offering to the public full sets of teeth, opiates, powders, and elixirs. Fontine mingled in the group and began to laugh with the rest at the harangue, which contained slang for the populace and jargon for respectable people. The tooth-puller espied the lovely laughing girl and suddenly exclaimed, "'You have beautiful teeth, you girl there, who are laughing. If you want to sell me your palates, I will give you a gold napoleon apiece for them.' "'What are my palates?' asked Fontine. "'The palates,' replied the dental professor, "'are the front teeth, the two upper ones.' "'How horrible!' exclaimed Fontine. Two Napoleons!' grumbled a toothless old woman who was present. "'Here's a lucky girl!' Fontine fled and stopped her ears that she might not hear the hoarse voice of the man shouting to her. "'Reflect, my beauty! Two Napoleons! They may prove of service! If your heart bids you come this evening to the inn of the Tilac d'Argent, you will find me there!' Fontine returned home. She was furious, and related the occurrence to her good neighbor Marguerite. "'Can you understand such a thing? Is he not an abominable man? How could they allow such people to go about the country? Pull out my two front teeth! Why, I should be horrible! My hair will grow again, but my teeth? Ah, what a monster of a man! I should prefer to throw myself headfirst on the pavement from the fifth story. He told me that he should be at the Tilac d'Argent this evening.' "'And what did he offer?' asked Marguerite. Two Napoleons? That makes forty francs. Yes, said Fantine, that makes forty francs. She remained thoughtful and began her work. At the expiration of a quarter of an hour she left her sewing and went to read the Thénardier's letter once more on the staircase. On her return she said to Marguerite, who was at work beside her, What is a miliary fever, do you know? Yes, answered the old spinster, it is a disease. Does it require many drugs? Oh, terrible drugs. How does one get it? It is a malady that one gets without knowing how. Then it attacks children? Children in particular. Do people die of it? They may, said Marguerite. Fontine left the room and went to read her letter once more on the staircase. That evening she went out and was seen to turn her steps in the direction of the Rue de Paris, where the inns are situated. The next morning, when Marguerite entered Fantine's room before daylight, for they always worked together, and in this manner used only one candle for the two, she found Fantine seated on her bed, pale and frozen, she had not lain down. Her cap had fallen on her knees. Her candle had burned all night and was almost entirely consumed. Marguerite halted on the threshold, petrified at this tremendous wastefulness, and exclaimed, Look! The candle is all burned out! Something has happened! Then she looked at Fantine, 
who had turned toward her head bereft of its hair. Fantine had grown ten years older since the preceding night. Jesus, said Marguerite, what is the matter with you, Fantine? Nothing, replied Fantine. Quite the contrary. My child will not die of that frightful malady, for lack of succor. I am content. So saying, she pointed out to the spinster two Napoleons which were glittering on the table. Ah, Jesus God, cried Marguerite, why it is a fortune. Where did you get those Louis d'Or? I got them, replied Fantine. At the same time she smiled. The candle illuminated her countenance. It was a bloody smile. A reddish saliva soiled the corners of her lips, and she had a black hole in her mouth. The two teeth had been extracted. She sent the forty franc to Montfermeil. After all, it was a ruse of the Thénardier to obtain money. Cosette was not ill. Fontaine threw her mirror out of the window. She had long since quitted her cell on the second floor for an attic with only a latch to fasten it next to the roof, one of those attics whose extremity forms an angle with the floor and knocks you on the head every instant. The poor occupant can reach the end of his chamber as he can the end of his destiny only by bending over more and more. She had no longer a bed, a rag which she called her coverlet, a mattress on the floor, and a seatless chair still remained. A little rosebush which she had had dried up, forgotten, in one corner. In the other corner was a butter pot to hold water, which froze in winter, and in which the various levels of the water remained long marked by those circles of ice. She had lost her shame. She lost her coquetry. A final sign. She went out with dirty caps. Whether from lack of time or from indifference, she no longer mended her linen. As the heels wore out, she dragged her stockings down into her shoes. This was evident from the perpendicular wrinkles. She patched her bodice, which was old and worn out, with scraps of calico which tore at the slightest movement. The people to whom she was indebted made scenes and gave her no peace. She found them in the street. She found them again on her staircase. She passed many a night weeping and thinking. Her eyes were very bright, and she felt a steady pain in her shoulder towards the top of the left shoulder blade. She coughed a great deal. She deeply hated Father Madeleine, but made no complaint. She sewed seventeen hours a day, but a contractor for the work of prisons, who made the prisoners work at a discount, suddenly made prices fall, which reduced the daily earnings of working women to nine sous. Seventeen hours of toil and nine sous a day. Her creditors were more pitiless than ever. The second-hand dealer, who had taken back nearly all his furniture, said to her incessantly, "'When will you pay me, you hussy?' What did they want of her, good God? She felt that she was being hunted, and something of the wild beast developed in her. About the same time, Thénardier wrote to her that he had waited with decidedly too much amiability, and that he must have a hundred francs at once. Otherwise he would turn little Cosette out of doors, convalescent as she was from her heavy illness, into the cold in the streets, and that she might do what she liked with herself and die if she chose. A hundred francs, thought Fantine. But in what trade can one earn a hundred sous a day? Come, said she, let us sell what is left. The unfortunate girl became a woman of the town. End of Book 5, Chapter 10 Read by Zachary Brewster Geis, Greenbelt, Maryland, June 2007《Book Five, Chapter Eleven of Les Misérables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zachary Brewster Geis. Les Misérables by Victor Hugo, Book Fifth, The Descent, Chapter Eleven. Christus nos liberavit. What is this history of Fontaine? It is society purchasing a slave. From whom? From misery. From hunger, cold, isolation, destitution. A dolorous bargain. 
a soul for a morsel of bread. Misery offers, society accepts. The sacred law of Jesus Christ governs our civilization, but it does not as yet permeate it. It is said that slavery has disappeared from European civilization. This is a mistake. It still exists, but it weighs only upon the woman, and it is called prostitution. It weighs upon the woman, that is to say, upon grace, weakness, beauty, maternity. This is not one of the least of man's disgraces. At the point in this melancholy drama which we have now reached, nothing is left to Fontaine of that which had formerly been. She has become marble in becoming mire. Whoever touches her feels cold. She passes, she endures you, she ignores you. She is the severe and dishonored figure. Life and the social order have said their last word for her. All has happened to her that will happen to her. She has felt everything, born everything, experienced everything, suffered everything, lost everything, mourned everything. She is resigned with that resignation which resembles indifference as death resembles sleep. She no longer avoids anything. Let all the clouds fall upon her and all the ocean sweep over her. What matters it to her? She is a sponge that is soaked. At least she believes it to be so, but it is an error to imagine that fate can be exhausted and that one has reached the bottom of anything whatever. Alas, what are all these fates driven on pell-mell? Whither are they going? Why are they thus? He who knows that sees the whole of the shadow. He is alone. His name is God. End of Book 5, Chapter 10 Read by Zachary Brewster Geis, Greenbelt, Maryland, June 2007Book 5, Chapter 12 of Les Miserables Translated by Isabel F. Hapgood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zachary Brewster Geis Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Book Fifth The Descent Chapter Twelve Monsieur Bamatabois' Inactivity There is in all small towns, and there was at montreuil sur mer in particular, a class of young men who nibble away an income of fifteen hundred francs with the same air with which their prototypes devour two hundred thousand francs a year in Paris. These are beings of the great neuter species, impotent men, parasites, ciphers, who have a little land, a little folly, a little wit, who would be rustics in a drawing-room, and who think themselves gentlemen in the dram-shop, who say, My fields, my peasants, my woods, who hiss actresses at the theatre to prove that they are persons of taste, quarrel with the officers of the garrison to prove that they are men of war, hunt, smoke, yawn, drink, smell of tobacco, play billiards, stare at travellers as they descend from the diligence, live at the café, dine at the inn, have a dog which eats the bones under the table, and a mistress who eats the dishes on the table, who stick at a sou, exaggerate the fashions, admire tragedy, despise women, wear out their old boots, copy London through Paris, and Paris through the medium of pont a mousson grow old as dullards, never work, serve no use, and do no great harm. Monsieur Félix Tolomai, had he remained in his own province and never beheld Paris, would have been one of these men. If they were richer, one could say, they are dandies. If they were poorer, one would say, they are idlers. They are simply men without employment. Among these unemployed there are bores, the bored, dreamers, and some knaves. At that period a dandy was composed of a tall collar, a big cravat, a watch with trinkets, three vests of different colors, worn one on top of the other, the red and blue inside, of a short-waisted olive coat with a codfish tail, a double row of silver buttons set close to each other and running up to the shoulder, and a pair of trousers of a lighter shade of olive ornamented on the two seams with an indefinite but always uneven number of lines varying from one to eleven, a limit which was never exceeded. 
Add to this high shoes with little irons on the heels, a tall hat with a narrow brim, hair worn in a tuft, an enormous cane, and conversation set off by puns of potier. Over all spurs and a moustache. At that epoch moustaches indicated the bourgeois and spurs the pedestrian. The provincial dandy wore the longest of spurs and the fiercest of moustaches. It was the period of the conflict of the republics of South America with the king of Spain, of Bolivar against Morillo. Narrow-brimmed hats were royalist and were called Morillos. Liberals wore hats with wide brims, which were called Bolivars. Eight or ten months, then, after that which is related in the preceding pages, towards the first of January, 1823, on a snowy evening, one of these dandies, one of these unemployed, a right thinker, for he wore a Murillo, and was moreover warmly enveloped in one of those large cloaks which completed the fashionable costume in cold weather, was amusing himself by tormenting a creature who was prowling about in a ball-dress, with neck uncovered and flowers in her hair, in front of the officer's café. This dandy was smoking, for he was decidedly fashionable. Each time that the woman passed in front of him, he bestowed on her, together with a puff from his cigar, some apostrophe which he considered witty and mirthful, such as, "'How ugly you are! Will you get out of my sight? You have no teeth!' etc., etc. This gentleman was known as Monsieur Bamatabois. The woman, a melancholy, decorated spectre which went and came through the snow, made him no reply, did not even glance at him, and nevertheless continued her promenade in silence, and with a somber regularity which brought her every five minutes within the reach of this sarcasm, like the condemned soldier who returns under the rods. The small effect which he produced no doubt piqued the lounger, and taking advantage of a moment when her back was turned, he crept up behind her with the gait of a wolf, and stifling his laugh, bent down, picked up a handful of snow from the pavement, and thrust it abruptly into her back between her bare shoulders. The woman uttered a roar, whirled round, gave a leap like a panther, and hurled herself upon the man, burying her nails in his face with the most frightful words which could fall from the guard-room into the gutter. These insults poured forth in a voice roughened by brandy did indeed proceed in hideous wise from a mouth which lacked its two front teeth. It was Fantine. At the noise thus produced, the officers ran out in throngs from the café, passers-by collected, and a large and merry circle, hooting and applauding, was formed around this whirlwind composed of two beings, whom there was some difficulty in recognizing as a man and a woman. The man struggling, his hat on the ground, the woman striking out with feet and fists, bareheaded, howling, minus hair and teeth, livid with wrath, horrible. Suddenly a man of lofty stature emerged vivaciously from the crowd, seized the woman by her satin bodice, which was covered with mud, and said to her, "'Follow me!' The woman raised her head. Her furious voice suddenly died away. Her eyes were glassy, she turned pale instead of livid, and she trembled with a quiver of terror. She had recognized Javert. The dandy took advantage of the incident to make his escape. End of Book 5, Chapter 12 Read by Zachary Brewster Geis, Greenbelt, Maryland, June 2007「Book 5, Chapter 13 of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine Eastman. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book 5, The Descent. Chapter 13, the solution of some questions connected with the municipal police. Javert thrust aside the spectators, broke the circle, and set out with long strides towards the police station, which is situated at the extremity of the square, dragging the wretched woman after him. She yielded mechanically. Neither he nor she uttered a word. The cloud of spectators followed, jesting in a paroxysm of delight. Supreme misery, an occasion for obscenity. On arriving at the police station, 
which was a low room, warmed by a stove, with a glazed and grated door opening on the street, and guarded by a detachment, Javert opened the door, entered with Fantine, and shut the door behind him, to the great disappointment of the curious, who raised themselves on tiptoe, and craned their necks in front of the thick glass of the station-house in their efforts to see. Curiosity is a sort of gluttony. To see is to devour. On entering, Fantine fell down in a corner, motionless and mute, crouching down like a terrified dog. The sergeant of the guard brought a lighted candle to the table. Javert seated himself, drew a sheet of stamped paper from his pocket, and began to write. This class of women is consigned by our laws entirely to the discretion of the police. The latter do what they please, punish them as seems good to them, and confiscate at their will those two sorry things which they entitle their industry and their liberty. Javert was impassive. His grave face betrayed no emotion whatever. Nevertheless, he was seriously and deeply preoccupied. It was one of those moments when he was exercising, without control, but subject to all the scruples of a severe conscience, his redoubtable discretionary power. At that moment he was conscious that his police agent's stool was a tribunal. He was entering judgment, he judged and condemned. He summoned all the ideas which could possibly exist in his mind around the great thing which he was doing. The more he examined the deed of this woman, the more shocked he felt. It was evident that he had just witnessed the commission of a crime. He had just beheld yonder in the street society in the person of a freeholder and an elector, insulted and attacked by a creature who was outside all pales. A prostitute had made an attempt on the life of a citizen. He had seen that. He, Javert, he wrote in silence. When he had finished, he signed the paper, folded it, and said to the sergeant of the guard as he handed it to him, Take three men and conduct this creature to jail. Then, turning to Fantine, "'You are to have six months of it.' The unhappy woman shuddered. Six months! Six months of prison!' she exclaimed. Six months in which to earn seven sous a day! But what will become of Cosette? My daughter, my daughter! But I still owe the Thénardiers over a hundred francs. Do you know that, Monsieur Inspector?' She dragged herself across the damp floor, among the muddy boots of all those men, without rising, with clasped hands, and taking great strides on her knees. "'Monsieur Javert,' said she, "'I beseech your mercy. I assure you that I was not in the wrong. If you had seen the beginning, you would have seen. I swear to you by the good God that I was not to blame. That gentleman, the bourgeois whom I do not know, put snow in my back.' Has any one the right to put snow down our backs when we are walking along peaceably and doing no harm to any one? I am rather ill, as you see. And then he had been saying impertinent things to me for a long time. You are ugly, you have no teeth. I know well that I have no longer those teeth. I did nothing, I said to myself. The gentleman is amusing himself. I was honest with him. I did not speak to him. It was at that moment that he put the snow down my back. Monsieur Javert, good Monsieur Inspector, is there not some person here who saw it and can tell you that this is quite true? Perhaps I did wrong to get angry. You know that one is not master of one's self at the first moment. One gives way to vivacity. And then, when someone puts something cold down your back just when you are not expecting it, I did wrong to spoil that gentleman's hat. Why did he go away? I would ask his pardon. Oh, my God! It makes no difference to me whether I ask his pardon. Do me the favor today for this once, Monsieur Javert. Oh, you do not know that in prison one can earn only seven sous a day. It is not the government's fault, but seven sous is one's earnings. And just fancy, I must pay one hundred francs, or my little girl will be sent to me. Oh, my God! 
I cannot have her with me. What I do is so vile. Oh, my Cosette, oh, my little angel of the Holy Virgin, what will become of her, poor creature? I will tell you, it is the Thenardiers, innkeepers, peasants, and such people are unreasonable. They want money. Don't put me in prison. You see, there is a little girl who will be turned out into the street to get along as best she may in the very heart of the winter, and you must have pity on such a being, my good Monsieur Javert. If she were older, she might earn her living, but it cannot be done at that age. I am not a bad woman at bottom. It is not cowardliness and gluttony that have made me what I am. If I have drunk brandy, it was out of misery. I do not love it but it benumbs the senses. When I was happy, it was only necessary to glance into my closets, and it would have been evident that I was not a coquettish and untidy woman. I had linen, a great deal of linen. Have pity on me, Monsieur Javert. She spoke thus, rent in twain, shaken with sobs, blinded with tears, her neck bare, wringing her hands, and coughing with a dry, short cough, stammering softly with a voice of agony. Great sorrow is a divine and terrible ray which transfigures the unhappy. At that moment, Fantine had become beautiful once more. From time to time she paused and tenderly kissed the police agent's coat. She would have softened a heart of granite, but a heart of wood cannot be softened. Come, said Javert. I have heard you out. Have you entirely finished? You will get six months. Now march. The Eternal Father in person could do nothing more. At these solemn words, the Eternal Father in person could do nothing more. She understood that her fate was sealed. She sank down, murmuring, Mercy! Javert turned his back. The soldiers seized her by the arms. A few moments earlier, a man had entered, but no one had paid any heed to him. He shut the door, leaned his back against it, and listened to Fantine's despairing supplications. At the instant when the soldiers laid their hands upon the unfortunate woman, who would not rise, he emerged from the shadow and said, "'One moment, if you please.' Javert raised his eyes and recognized Monsieur Madeleine. He removed his hat, and, saluting him with a sort of aggrieved awkwardness, "'Excuse me, Monsieur Maire.' The words Monsieur Maire produced a curious effect upon Fantine. She rose to her feet with one bound, like a spectre springing from the earth, thrust aside the soldiers with both arms, walked straight up to Monsieur Madeleine before any one could prevent her, and, gazing intently at him with a bewildered air, she cried, "'Ah! so it is you who are Monsieur le Maire!' Then she burst into a laugh and spit in his face. Monsieur Madeleine wiped his face and said, "'Inspector Javert, set this woman at liberty.' Javert felt that he was on the verge of going mad." He experienced at that moment blow upon blow, and almost simultaneously the most violent emotions which he had ever undergone in all his life. To see a woman of the town spit in the mayor's face was a thing so monstrous that, in his most daring flights of fancy, he would have regarded it as a sacrilege to believe it possible. On the other hand, at the very bottom of his thought, he made a hideous comparison as to what this woman was, and as to what this mare might be. And then he, with horror, caught a glimpse of I know not what simple explanation of this prodigious attack. But when he beheld that mare, that magistrate, calmly wipe his face and say, Set this woman at liberty, he underwent a sort of intoxication of amazement, Thought and word failed him equally. The sum total of possible astonishment had been exceeded in his case. He remained mute. The words had produced no less strange an effect on Fantine. 
She raised her bare arm and clung to the damper of the stove, like a person who was reeling. Nevertheless, she glanced about her and began to speak in a low voice, as though talking to herself. "'At liberty! I am to be allowed to go? I am not to go to prison for six months? Who said that? It is not possible that any one could have said that. I did not hear aright. It cannot have been that monster of a mare. Was it you, my good Monsieur Javert, who said that I was to be set free? Oh, see here! I will tell you about it, and you will let me go. That monster of a mare, that old blackguard of a mare, is the cause of all. Just imagine, Monsieur Javert, he turned me out, all because of a pack of rascally women who gossip in the workroom. If that is not a horror, what is? To dismiss a poor girl who is doing her work honestly. Then I could no longer earn enough, and all this misery followed. In the first place, there is one improvement which these gentlemen of the police ought to make, and that is to prevent prison contractors from wronging poor people. I will explain it to you, you see. You are earning twelve sous at shirt-making. The price falls to nine sous, and it is not enough to live on. Then one has to become whatever one can. As for me, I had my little Cosette, and I was actually forced to become a bad woman. Now you understand how it is that that blackguard of a mare caused all the mischief. After that, I stamped on that gentleman's hat in front of the officer's café, but he had spoiled my whole dress with snow. We women have but one silk dress for evening wear. You see that I did not do wrong deliberately, truly, Monsieur Javert, and everywhere I behold women who are far more wicked than I, and who are much happier. Oh, Monsieur Javert, it was you who gave orders that I am to be set free, was it not? Make inquiries, speak to my landlord. I am paying my rent now, they will tell you that I am perfectly honest. Ah, my God, I beg your pardon, I have unintentionally touched the damper of the stove, and it has made it smoke. Monsieur Madeleine listened to her with profound attention. While she was speaking, he fumbled in his waistcoat, drew out his purse, and opened it. It was empty. He put it back in his pocket. He said to Fantine, How much did you say that you owed? Fantine, who was looking at Javert only, turned towards him. Was I speaking to you? Then, addressing the soldiers, Say, you fellows, did you see how I spit in his face? Ah, you old wretch of a mayor, you came here to frighten me, but I'm not afraid of you. I am afraid of Monsieur Javert. I am afraid of my good Monsieur Javert. So saying, she turned to the inspector again. And yet you see, Monsieur Inspector, it is necessary to be just. I understand that you are just, Monsieur Inspector. In fact, it is perfectly simple. A man amuses himself by putting snow down a woman's back, and that makes the officers laugh. One must divert themselves in some way, and we, well, we are here for them to amuse themselves with, of course. And then you, you come. You are certainly obliged to preserve order. You lead off the woman who is in the wrong. But on reflection, since you are a good man, you say that I am to be set at liberty. It is for the sake of the little one, for six months in prison would prevent my supporting my child. Only don't do it again, you hussy. Oh, I won't do it again, Monsieur Javert. They may do whatever they please to me now. I will not stir. But today, you see, I cried because it hurt me. I was not expecting that snow from the gentleman at all. And then, as I told you, I am not well. I have a cough. I seem to have a burning ball in my stomach. And the doctor tells me, take care of yourself. Here, feel, give me your hand. Don't be afraid. It is here. She no longer wept. Her voice was caressing. She placed Javert's coarse hand on her delicate white throat, and looked smilingly at him. All at once she rapidly adjusted her disordered garments, dropped the folds of her skirt, which had been pushed up as she dragged herself along almost to the height of her knee, and stepped towards the door, saying to the soldiers in a low voice and with a friendly nod, "'Children, Monsieur l'Inspecteur has said that I am to be released, and I am going.' She laid her hand on the latch of the door. 
one step more, and she would be in the street. Javert, up to that moment, had remained erect, motionless, with his eyes fixed on the ground, cast athwart this scene like some displaced statue which is waiting to be put away somewhere. The sound of the latch roused him. He raised his head with an expression of sovereign authority, an expression all the more alarming in proportion as the authority rests on a low level, ferocious in the wild beast, atrocious in the man of no estate. "'Sergeant,' he cried, "'don't you see that that jade is walking off? Who bade you let her go?' "'I,' said Madeleine. Fantine trembled at the sound of Javert's voice, and let go of the latch as a thief relinquishes the article which he has stolen. At the sound of Madeleine's voice she turned around, and from that moment forth she uttered no word, nor dared so much as to breathe freely. But her glance strayed from Madeleine to Javert, and from Javert to Madeleine in turn, according to which was speaking. It was evident that Javert must have been exasperated beyond measure before he would permit himself to apostrophize the sergeant as he had done, after the mayor's suggestion that Fantine should be set at liberty. Had he reached the point of forgetting the mayor's presence? Had he finally declared to himself that it was impossible that any authority should have given such an order, and that the mayor must certainly have said one thing by mistake for another without intending it? Or, in view of the enormities of which he had been a witness for the past two hours, did he say to himself that it was necessary to recur to supreme resolutions, that it was indispensable that the small should be made great, that the police spy should transform himself into a magistrate, that the policeman should become a dispenser of justice, and that, in this prodigious extremity, order, law, morality, government, society in its entirety, was personified in him, Javert? However that may be, when Monsieur Madeleine uttered the word, I, as we have just heard, police inspector Javert was seen to turn toward the mayor, pale, cold, with blue lips, and a look of despair, his whole body agitated by an imperceptible quiver and an unprecedented occurrence, and say to him, with downcast eye, but a firm voice, "'Monsieur Mayor, that cannot be.' "'Why not?' said Monsieur Madeleine. "'This miserable woman has insulted a citizen.' "'Inspector Javert,' replied the mayor, in a calm and conciliating tone. Listen, you are an honest man, and I feel no hesitation in explaining matters to you. Here is the true state of the case. I was passing through the square just as you were leading this woman away. There were still groups of people standing about, and I made inquiries and learned everything. It was the townsman who was in the wrong, and who should have been arrested by properly conducted police. Javert retorted, "'This wretch has just insulted Monsieur le Maire.' "'That concerns me,' said Monsieur Madeleine. "'My own insult belongs to me, I think. I can do what I please about it.' "'I beg Monsieur le Maire's pardon. The insult is not to him, but to the law.' "'Inspector Javert,' replied Monsieur Madeleine, "'the highest law is conscience.' I have heard this woman, I know what I am doing. And I, Monsieur Mayor, do not know what I see. Then content yourself with obeying. I am obeying my duty. My duty demands that this woman shall serve six months in prison. Monsieur Madeleine replied gently, Heed this well, she will not serve a single day. At this decisive word, Javert ventured to fix a searching look on the mayor, and to say, but in a tone of voice that was still profoundly respectful, "'I am sorry to oppose Monsieur le maire. It is for the first time in my life, but he will permit me to remark that I am within the bounds of my authority. I confine myself, since Monsieur le maire desires it, to the question of the gentleman. I was present.' This woman flung herself on Monsieur Bamatabnois, 
who is an elector and the proprietor of that handsome house with a balcony, which forms the corner of the esplanade, three stories high and entirely of cut stone, such things as there are in the world. In any case, Monsieur le Maire, this is a question of police regulations in the streets, and concerns me, and I shall detain this woman Fantine. Then Monsieur Madeleine folded his arms, and said, in a severe voice which no one in the town had heard hitherto, The matter to which you refer is one connected with the municipal police. According to the terms of Articles 9, 11, 15, and 66 of the Code of Criminal Examination, I am the judge. I order that this woman shall be set at liberty. Javert ventured to make a final effort. But, Monsieur Maire, I refer you to Article 81 of the Law of the 13th of December, 1799, in regard to arbitrary detention. Monsieur le Maire, permit me not another word. But leave the room, said Monsieur Madeleine. Javert received the blow erect, full in the face, in his breast, like a Russian soldier. He bowed to the very earth before the mayor, and left the room. Fantine stood aside from the door, and stared at him in amazement as he passed. Nevertheless, she also was the prey to a strange confusion. She had just seen herself a subject of dispute between two opposing powers. She had seen two men who held in their hands her liberty, her life, her soul, her child, in combat before her very eyes. One of these men was drawing her towards darkness, the other was leading her back towards the light. In this conflict, viewed through the exaggerations of terror, these two men had appeared to her like two giants. The one spoke like her demon, the other like her good angel. The angel had conquered the demon, and, strange to say, that which made her shudder from head to foot was the fact that this angel, this liberator, was the very man whom she abhorred, that mayor whom she had so long regarded as the author of all her woes, that Madeleine. And at the very moment when she had insulted him in so hideous a fashion, he had saved her. Had she then been mistaken? Must she change her whole soul? She did not know. She trembled. She listened in bewilderment, she looked on in affright, and at every word uttered by Monsieur Madeleine, she felt the frightful shades of hatred crumble and melt within her, and something warm and ineffable, indescribable, which was both joy, confidence, and love, dawn in her heart. When Javert had taken his departure, Monsieur Madeleine turned to her, and said to her in a deliberate voice, like a serious man who does not wish to weep, and who finds some difficulty in speaking. I have heard you. I knew nothing about what you have mentioned. I believe that it is true, and I feel that it is true. I was even ignorant of the fact that you had left my shop. Why did you not apply to me? But here, I will pay your debts, I will send for your child, or you shall go to her. You shall live here, in Paris, or where you please. I undertake the care of your child and yourself. You shall not work any longer, if you do not like. I will give all the money you require. You shall be honest and happy once more. And, listen, I declare to you that if all is as you say, and I do not doubt it, you have never ceased to be virtuous and holy in the sight of God. Oh, poor woman! This was more than Fantine could bear. To have Cosette, to leave this life of infamy, to live free, rich, happy, respectable with Cosette, to see all these realities of paradise blossom of a sudden in the midst of her misery. She stared stupidly at this man who was talking to her, and could only give vent to two or three sobs. Oh, oh, oh. Her limbs gave way beneath her, she knelt in front of Monsieur Madeleine, and before he could prevent her, he felt her grasp his hand and press her lips to it. Then she fainted. 
End of Book 5, Chapter 13 of Les Miserables. Book 6, Chapter 1 of Les Miserables. Translated by Isabella F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book 6, Javert. Chapter 1. The Beginning of Repose. Monsieur Madeleine had Fantine removed to that infirmary which he had established in his own house. He confided her to the sisters, who put her to bed. A burning fever had come on. She passed a part of the night in delirium and raving. At length, however, she fell asleep. On the morrow, towards midday, Fantine awoke. She heard someone breathing close to her bed. She drew aside the curtain, and saw Monsieur Madeleine standing there and looking at something over her head. His gaze was full of pity, anguish, and supplication. She followed its direction, and saw that it was fixed on a crucifix which was nailed to the wall. Thenceforth, Monsieur Madeleine was transfigured in Fantine's eyes. He seemed to her to be clothed in light. He was absorbed in a sort of prayer. She gazed at him for a long time without daring to interrupt him. At last she said timidly, What are you doing? Monsieur Madeleine had been there for an hour. He had been waiting for Fantine to awake. He took her hand, felt of her pulse, and replied, How do you feel? Well, I have slept, she replied. I think that I am better. It is nothing. He answered, responding to the first question which she had put to him, as though he had just heard it. I was praying to the martyr there on high. And he added in his own mind, For the martyr here below. Monsieur Madeleine had passed the night and the morning in making inquiries. He knew all now. He knew Fantine's history in all its heart-rending details. He went on. You have suffered much, poor mother. Oh, do not complain. You now have the dowry of the elect. It is thus that men are transformed into angels. It is not their fault they do not know how to go to work otherwise. You see, this hell from which you have just emerged is the first form of heaven. It was necessary to begin there." He sighed deeply, but she smiled on him with that sublime smile in which two teeth were lacking. That same night Javert wrote a letter. The next morning he posted it himself at the office of montre sur mer It was addressed to Paris, and the superscription ran, To Monsieur Chabouillet, secretary of Monsieur le Préfet of Police. As the affair in the station-house had been brooded about, the postmistress and some other persons who saw the letter before it was sent off, and who recognized Javert's handwriting on the cover, thought that he was sending in his resignation. Monsieur Madeleine made haste to write to the Thenardiers. Fantine owed them one hundred and twenty francs. He sent them three hundred francs, telling them to pay themselves from that sum, and to fetch the child instantly to montre sur mer where her sick mother required her presence. This dazzled Thenardier. "'The devil!' said the man to his wife. "'Don't let's allow the child to go!' This lark is going to turn into a milch cow. I see through it. Some ninny has taken a fancy to the mother. He replied with a very well drawn up bill for five hundred and some odd francs. In this memorandum, two indisputable items 
figured up over three hundred francs, one for the doctor, the other for the apothecary, who had attended and physicked Eponine and Azelma through two long illnesses. Cosette, as we have already said, had not been ill. It was only a question of a trifling substitution of names. At the foot of the memorandum, Thenardier wrote, Received on account three hundred francs. Monsieur Madeleine immediately sent three hundred francs more, and wrote, Make haste to bring Cosette. Christy, said Thenardier, let's not give up the child. In the meantime, Fantine did not recover. She still remained in the infirmary. The sisters had at first only received and nursed that woman with repugnance. Those who have seen the bas-reliefs of Reims will recall the inflation of the lower lip of the wise virgins as they survey the foolish virgins. The ancient scorn of the vestals for the Ambubage is one of the most profound instincts of feminine dignity. The sisters felt it with the double force contributed by religion. But in a few days Fantine disarmed them. She said all kinds of humble and gentle things, and the mother in her provoked tenderness. One day the sisters heard her say amid her fever, I have been a sinner, but when I have my child beside me, it will be a sign that God has pardoned me. While I was leading a bad life, I should not have liked to have my Cosette with me. I could not have borne her sad, astonished eyes. It was for her sake that I did evil, and that is why God pardons me. I shall feel the benediction of the good God when Cosette is here. I shall gaze at her. It will do me good to see that innocent creature. She knows nothing at all. She is an angel, you see, my sisters. At that age the wings have not fallen off. Monsieur Madeleine went to see her twice a day, and each time she asked him, Shall I see my Cosette soon? He answered, Tomorrow, perhaps. She may arrive at any moment. I am expecting her. And the mother's pale face grew radiant. Oh, she said, how happy I am going to be. We have just said that she did not recover her health. On the contrary, her condition seemed to become more grave from week to week. That handful of snow applied to her bare skin between her shoulder blades had brought about a sudden suppression of perspiration, as a consequence of which the malady which had been smouldering within her for many years was violently developed at last. At that time people were beginning to follow the fine Linnex fine suggestions on the study and treatment of chest maladies. The doctor sounded Fantine's chest and shook his head. Monsieur Madeleine said to the doctor, Well, has she not a child which she desires to see? said the doctor. Yes. Well, make haste and get it here. Monsieur Madeleine shuddered. Fantine inquired, What did the doctor say? Monsieur Madeleine forced himself to smile. He said that your child was to be brought speedily, that that would restore your health. Oh, she rejoined, he is right, but what do those Thenardiers mean by keeping my Cosette from me? Oh, she is coming. At last I behold happiness close beside me. In the meantime, Thenardier did not let go of the child, and gave a hundred insufficient reasons for it. Cosette was not quite well enough to take a journey in the winter, and then there still remained some petty but pressing debts in the neighborhood, and they were collecting the bills for them, etc., etc. I shall send someone to fetch Cosette, said Father Madeleine. If necessary, I will go myself. 
he wrote the following letter to Fantine's dictation, and made her sign it. Monsieur Thenardier, you will deliver Cosette to this person. You will be paid for all the little things. I have the honor to salute you with respect. Fantine. In the meantime, a serious incident occurred. Carve as we will the mysterious block of which our life is made, the black fane of destiny constantly reappears in it. End of Book Six, Chapter One Book Six, Chapter Two of Les Miserables Translated by Isabel F. Hapgood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Book Six, Javert Chapter Two How Jean May Become Sham one morning, Monsieur Madeleine was in his study, occupied in arranging in advance some pressing matters connected with the mayor's office, in case he should decide to take the trip to Montfermeil, when he was informed that police inspector Javert was desirous of speaking with him. Madeleine could not refrain from a disagreeable impression on hearing this name. Javert had avoided him more than ever since the affair of the police station, and Monsieur Madeleine had not seen him. Admit him, he said. Javert entered. Monsieur Madeleine had retained his seat near the fire, pen in hand, his eyes fixed on the docket which he was turning over and annotating, and which contained the trials of the Commission on Highways for the infraction of police regulations. He did not disturb himself on Javert's account. He could not help thinking of poor Fantine, and it suited him to be glacial in his manner. Javert bestowed a respectful salute on the mayor, whose back was turned to him. The mayor did not look at him, but went on annotating the stocket. Javert advanced two or three paces into the study, and halted, without breaking the silence. If any physiognomist who had been familiar with Javert, and who had made a lengthy study of this savage in the service of civilization, this singular composite of the Roman, the Spartan, the monk, and the corporal, the spy who was incapable of a lie, this unspotted police agent. If any physiognomist had known his secret and long-cherished aversion for Monsieur Madeleine, his conflict with the mayor on the subject of Fantine, and had examined Javert at that moment, he would have said to himself, What has taken place? It was evident to anyone acquainted with that clear, upright, sincere, honest, austere, and ferocious conscience that Javert had but just gone through some great interior struggle. Javert had nothing in his soul which he had not also in his countenance. Like violent people in general, he was subject to abrupt changes of opinion. His physiognomy had never been more peculiar and startling. On entering, he bowed to Monsieur Madeleine with a look in which there was neither rancor, anger, nor distrust. He halted a few paces in the rear of the mayor's armchair, and there he stood, perfectly erect, in an attitude almost of discipline, with the cold, ingenuous roughness of a man who has never been gentle, and who has always been patient. He waited without uttering a word, without making a movement in genuine humility and tranquil resignation, calm, serious, hat in hand, with eyes cast down, and an expression which was halfway between that of a soldier in the presence of his officer and a criminal in the presence of his judge, until it should please the mayor to turn around. All the sentiments, as well as all the memories which one might have attributed to him, had disappeared. That face, as impenetrable and simple as granite, no longer bore any trace of anything but a melancholy depression. His whole person breathed lowliness and firmness 
and an indescribable courageous despondency. At last the mayor laid down his pen and turned half round. Well, what is it? What is the matter, Javert? Javert remained silent for an instant, as though collecting his ideas, then raised his voice with a sort of sad solemnity, which did not, however, preclude simplicity. This is the matter, Monsieur Mayor. A culpable act has been committed. What act? An inferior agent of the authorities has failed in respect and in the gravest manner towards a magistrate. I have come to bring the fact to your attention, as it is my duty to do. Who is the agent? asked Monsieur Madeleine. I, said Javert. You? I. And who is the magistrate who has reason to complain of the agent? You, Monsieur Mayor. Monsieur Madeleine sat erect in his armchair. Javert went on, with a severe air, and his eyes still cast down. Monsieur Mayor, I have come to request you to instigate the authorities to dismiss me. Monsieur Madeleine opened his mouth in amazement. Javert interrupted him. You will say that I might have handed in my resignation, but that does not suffice. Handing in one's resignation is honorable. I have failed in my duty. I ought to be punished. I must be turned out. And after a pause he added, Monsieur Mayor, you were severe with me the other day, and unjustly. Be so today with justice. Come now, why? exclaimed Monsieur Madeleine. What nonsense is this? What is the meaning of this? What culpable act have you been guilty of towards me? What have you done to me? What are your wrongs with regard to me? You accuse yourself. You wish to be superseded. Turned out, said Javert. Turned out. So be it, then. That is well. I do not understand. You shall understand, Monsieur Mayor. Javert sighed from the very bottom of his chest, and resumed still coldly and sadly. Monsieur Mayor, six weeks ago, in consequence of the scene over that woman, I was furious, and I informed against you. Informed against me? At the prefecture of police in Paris. Monsieur Madeleine, who was not in the habit of laughing much oftener than Javert himself, burst out laughing now. As a mayor who had encroached on the province of the police? As an ex-convict. The mayor turned livid. Javert, who had not raised his eyes, went on. I thought it was so. I had had an idea for a long time, a resemblance, inquiries which you had caused to be made at Favreau, the strength of your loins, the adventure with old Fauchelevent, your skill in marksmanship, your leg which you drag a little. I hardly know what all. Absurdities. But, at all events, I took you for a certain Jean Valjean. A certain... what did you say the name was? Jean Valjean. He was a convict whom I was in the habit of seeing twenty years ago, when I was adjutant guard of convicts at Toulon. On leaving the galleys, this Jean Valjean, as it appears, robbed a bishop. Then he committed another theft, accompanied with violence on a public highway, on the person of a little Savoyard. He disappeared eight years ago, no one knows how, and he has been sought, I fancied. In short, I did this thing. Wrath impelled me. I denounced you at the prefecture. Monsieur Madeleine, who had taken up the docket again several moments before this, resumed with an air of perfect indifference. And what reply did you receive? That I was mad. Well? Well, they were right. It is lucky that you recognize the fact. I am forced to do so since the real Jean Valjean has been found. The sheet of paper which Monsieur Madeleine was holding dropped from his hand. He raised his head, gazed fixedly at Javert, and said with his indescribable accent, Ah! Javert continued, This is the way it is, Monsieur Mayor. 
it seems that there was in the neighborhood near ailly le au clocher an old fellow who was called Father Chamathieu. He was a very wretched creature. No one paid any attention to him. No one knows what such people subsist on. Lately, last autumn, Father Chamathieu was arrested for the theft of some cider apples from... Uh, well, no matter. A theft had been committed, a wall scaled, branches of trees broken. My Chamathieu was arrested. He still had the branch of apple tree in his hand. The scamp is locked up. Up to this point it was merely an affair of a misdemeanor, but here is where Providence intervened. The jail being in a bad condition, the examining magistrate finds it convenient to transfer Chamathieu to Arras, where the departmental prison is situated. In this prison at Arras there is an ex-convict named Brevet, who is detained for I know not what, and who has been appointed turnkey of the house because of good behavior. Monsieur Maire, no sooner had Chamathieu arrived than Brevet exclaims, Eh, hey, why I know that man! He is a faggot! Take a good look at me, my good man! You are Jean Valjean! Jean Valjean? Who's Jean Valjean? Chamathieu feigns astonishment. Don't play the innocent dodge, says Brevet. You are Jean Valjean. You have been at the galleys of Toulon. It was twenty years ago. We were there together. Chamathieu denies it. Uh, parbleu, you understand. The case is investigated. The thing was well ventilated for me. This is what they discovered. This Chamathieu had been, thirty years ago, a pruner of trees in various localities, notably at Faverol. There all trace of him was lost. A long time afterwards he was seen again in Auvergne, then in Paris, where he is said to have been a wheelwright, and to have had a daughter who was a laundress, but that has not been proved. Now, before going to the galleys for theft, what was Jean Valjean? A pruner of trees. Where? At Faverol. Another fact. This Valjean's Christian name was Jean, and his mother's surname was Mathieu. What more natural to suppose than that, on emerging from the galleys, he should have taken his mother's name for the purpose of concealing himself, and have called himself Jean Mathieu. He goes to Auvergne. The local pronunciation turns Jean into Jean. He is called Jean Mathieu. Our man offers no opposition, and behold him transformed into Jean Mathieu. You follow me, do you not? Inquiries were made at Faverol. The family of Jean Valjean is no longer there. It is not known where they have gone. You know that among those classes a family often disappears. Search was made and nothing was found. When such people are not mud, they are dust. And then, as the beginning of the story dates thirty years back, there is no longer anyone at Faverol who knew Jean Valjean. Inquiries were made at Toulon. Besides Brevet, there are only two convicts in existence who have seen Jean Valjean. They are Cochepaille and Chenardieu, and are sentenced for life. They are taken from the galleys and confronted with the pretended Chamathieu. They do not hesitate. He is Jean Valjean for them as well as for Brevet. The same age. He is fifty-four. The same height, the same air, the same man. In short, it is he. It was precisely at this moment that I forwarded my denunciation to the prefecture in Paris. I was told that I had lost my reason, and that Jean Valjean is at Arras, in the power of the authorities. You can imagine whether this surprised me, when I thought that I had that same Jean Valjean here. I write to the examining judge, he sends for me. Jean Mathieu is conducted to me. Well, interposed Monsieur Madeleine. Javert replied, his face incorruptible and as melancholy as ever. Monsieur Maire, the truth is the truth. I am sorry, but that man is Jean Valjean. I recognized him also. Monsieur Madeleine resumed in a very low voice. You are sure. Javert began to laugh, with that mournful laugh which comes from profound conviction. Oh, sure. He stood there thoughtfully for a moment, mechanically taking pinches of powdered wood for blotting ink from the wooden bowl which stood on the table, and he added, And even now that I have seen the real Jean Valjean, I do not see how I could have thought otherwise. I beg your pardon, Monsieur Maire. Javert, 
as he addressed these grave and supplicating words to the man who six weeks before had humiliated him in the presence of the whole station-house and bade him leave the room. Javert, that haughty man, was unconsciously full of simplicity and dignity. Monsieur Madeleine made no other reply to his prayer than the abrupt question, And what does this man say? Ah, indeed, Monsieur Maire, it's a bad business. If he is Jean Valjean, he has his previous conviction against him. To climb a wall, to break a branch, to purloin apples, is a mischievous trick in a child. For a man it is a misdemeanor. For a convict it is a crime. Robbing and housebreaking, it is all there. It is no longer a question of correctional police. It is a matter for the court of assizes. It is no longer a matter of a few days in prison. It is the galleys for life. And then there is the affair with the little Saviard, who will return, I hope. The deuce! There is plenty to dispute in the matter, is there not? Yes, for any one but Jean Valjean. But Jean Valjean is a sly dog. That is the way I recognized him. Any other man would have felt that things were getting hot for him. He would struggle, he would cry out. The kettle sings before the fire. He would not be Jean Valjean, etc., but he has not the appearance of understanding. He says, I am Chamathieu, and I won't depart from that. He has an astonished air. He pretends to be stupid. It is far better. Oh, the rogue is clever. But it makes no difference. The proofs are there. He has been recognized by four persons. The old scamp will be condemned. The case has been taken to the assizes at Arras. I shall go there to give my testimony. I have been summoned. Monsieur Madeleine had turned to his desk again, and taken up his docket, and was turning over the leaves tranquilly, reading and writing by turns like a busy man. He turned to Javert. That will do, Javert. In truth, all these details interest me but little. We are wasting our time, and we have pressing business on hand. Javert, you will betake yourself at once to the house of the woman Boussapier who sells herbs at the corner of the Rue saint -Sauve. You will tell her that she must enter her complaint against Carter Pierre Chenelon. The man is a brute who came near crushing this woman and her child. He must be punished. You will then go to Monsieur Charcier, Rue Montre de Champigny. He complained that there is a gutter on the adjoining house which discharges rainwater on his premises and is undermining the foundations of his house. After that, you will verify the infractions of police regulations which have been reported to me in the Rue Guibourg at Widow Doris, and Rue Garot Blanc at Madame René Lebos's, and you will prepare documents. But I am giving you a great deal of work. Are you not to be absent? Did you not tell me that you were going to Arras on that matter in a week or ten days? Sooner than that, Monsieur Maire. On what day, then? Why, I thought that I had said to Monsieur Le Maire that the case was to be tried to-morrow and that I am to set out by diligence to-night. Monsieur Madeleine made an imperceptible movement. And how long will the case last? One day, at the most. The judgment will be pronounced to-morrow evening, at latest. But I shall not wait for the sentence, which is certain. I shall return here as soon as my deposition has been taken. That is well, said Monsieur Madeleine. And he dismissed Javert with a wave of the hand. Javert did not withdraw. "'Excuse me, Monsieur Maire,' said he. "'What is it now?' demanded Monsieur Madeleine. "'Monsieur Maire, there is still something of which I must remind you.' "'What is it?' "'That I must be dismissed.' Monsieur Madeleine rose. "'Javert, you are a man of honour, and I esteem you. You exaggerate your fault.' Moreover, this is an offence which concerns me. Javert, you deserve promotion instead of degradation. I wish you to retain your post. Javert gazed at Monsieur Madeleine with his candid eyes, in whose depths his not very enlightened but pure and rigid conscience seemed visible, and said in a tranquil voice, Monsieur Maire, I cannot grant you that. I repeat, replied Monsieur Madeleine, that the matter concerns me. 
but Javert, heeding his own thought only, continued. So far as exaggeration is concerned, I am not exaggerating. This is the way I reason. I have suspected you unjustly. That is nothing. It is our right to cherish suspicion, although suspicion directed above ourselves is an abuse. But without proofs, in a fit of rage, with the object of wreaking my vengeance, I have denounced you as a convict, you a respectable man, a mayor, a magistrate. That is serious, very serious. I have insulted authority in your person, I an agent of the authorities. If one of my subordinates had done what I have done, I should have declared him unworthy of the service and have expelled him. Well, stop, Mr. Mayor. One word more. I have often been severe in the course of my life towards others. That is just. I have done well. Now, if I were not severe towards myself, all the justice that I have done would become injustice. Ought I to spare myself more than others? No. What? I should be good for nothing but to chastise others and not myself. Why, I should be a blackguard. Those who say that blackguard of a Javert would be in the right. Monsieur Mayor, I do not desire that you should treat me kindly. Your kindness roused sufficient bad blood in me when it was directed to others. I want none of it for myself. The kindness which consists in upholding a woman of the town against a citizen, the police agent against the mayor, the man who is down against the man who is up in the world, is what I call false kindness. That is the sort of kindness which disorganizes society. Good God! It is very easy to be kind. The difficulty lies in being just. Come, if you had been what I thought you, I should not have been kind to you, not I. You would have seen. Monsieur Mayor, I must treat myself as I would treat any other man. When I have subdued malefactors, when I have proceeded with vigor against rascals, I have often said to myself, if you flinch, if I ever catch you in a fault, you may rest at your ease. I have flinched. I have caught myself in a fault. So much the worse. Come, discharged, cashiered, expelled. That is well. I have arms. I will till the soil. It makes no difference to me. Monsieur Mayor, the good of the service demands an example. I simply require the discharge of Inspector Javert. All this was uttered in a proud, humble, despairing, yet convinced tone, which lent indescribable grandeur to this singular, honest man. We shall see, said Monsieur Madeleine, and he offered him his hand. Javert recoiled and said in a wild voice, Excuse me, Monsieur Mayor, but this must not be. A mayor does not offer his hand to a police spy. He added between his teeth, A police spy, yes. From the moment when I have misused the police, I am no more than a police spy. Then he bowed profoundly and directed his steps towards the door. There he wheeled round, and with eyes still downcast, Monsieur Mayor, he said, I shall continue to serve until I am superseded. He withdrew. Monsieur Madeleine remained thoughtfully listening to the firm, sure step, which died away on the pavement of the corridor. End of Book Six, Chapter Two Recorded by Peter Eastman Book Seven, Chapter One of Les Misérables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Les Misérables by Victor Hugo, Book Seven, Chapter One, Sister Simplice. The incidents the reader is about to peruse were not all known at Montreuil-sur-Mer. 
but the small portion of them which became known left such a memory in that town that a serious gap would exist in this book if we did not narrate them in their most minute details. Among these details the reader will encounter two or three improbable circumstances, which we preserve out of respect for the truth. On the afternoon following the visit of Javert, M. Madeleine went to see Fantine, according to his wont. Before entering Fantine's room, he had Sister Simplice summoned. The two nuns, who performed the services of nurse in the infirmary, Lazarist ladies, like all sisters of charity, bore the names of Sister Perpetue and Sister Simplice. Sister Perpetue was an ordinary villager, a sister of charity, in a coarse style, who had entered the service of God as one enters any other service. She was a nun, as other women are cooks. This type is not so very rare. The monastic orders gladly accept this heavy peasant earthenware, which is easily fashioned into a capuchin or an ursuline. These rustics are utilized for the rough work of devotion. The transition from a drover to a carmelite is not in the least violent. The one turns into the other without much effort. The fund of ignorance common to the village and the cloister is a preparation ready at hand, and places the boar at once on the same footing as the monk, a little more amplitude in the smock, and it becomes a frock. Sister Perpetue was a robust nun from the marines near Pontoise, who chattered her patois, droned, grumbled, sugared the potion according to the bigotry or the hypocrisy of the invalid, treated her patients abruptly, roughly, was crabbed with the dying, almost flung God in their faces, stoned their death agony with prayers mumbled in a rage, was bold, honest, and ruddy. Sister Simplice was white, with a waxen pallor. Besides Sister Perpetue, she was the taper beside the candle. Vincent de Paul has divinely traced the features of the Sister of Charity in these admirable words, in which he mingles as much freedom as servitude. They shall have for their convent only the house of the sick, for cell only a hired room, for chapel only their parish church, for cloister only the streets of the town and the words of the hospitals, for enclosure only obedience, for gratings only the fear of God, for veil, only modesty. This ideal was realized in the living person of Sister Simplice. She had never been young, and it seemed as though she would never grow old. No one could have told Sister Simplice's age. She was a person, we dare not say a woman, who was gentle, austere, well-bred, cold, and who had never lied. She was so gentle that she appeared fragile, but she was more solid than granite. She touched the unhappy with fingers that were charmingly pure and fine. There was, so to speak, silence in her speech. She said just what was necessary, and she possessed a tone of voice which would have equally edified a confessional or enchanted a drawing-room. This delicacy accommodated itself to the serge gown, finding in this harsh contact a continual reminder of heaven and of God. Let us emphasize one detail. Never to have lied, never to have said, for any interest whatever, even in indifference, any single thing which was not the truth, the sacred truth, was Sister Simplice's distinctive trait. It was the accent of her virtue. She was almost renowned in the congregation for this imperturbable veracity. 
The Abbe Sicard speaks of Sister Simplice in a letter to the deaf mute Monsieur. However pure and sincere we may be, we all bear upon our candor the crack of the little, innocent lie. She did not. Little lie, innocent lie. Does such a thing exist? To lie is the absolute form of evil. To lie a little is not possible. He who lies, lies the whole lie. To lie is the very face of the demon. Satan has two names. He is called Satan and lying. That is what she thought. And as she thought, so she did. The result was the whiteness which we have mentioned, a whiteness which covered even her lips and her eyes with radiance. Her smile was white. Her glance was white. There was not a single spider's web, not a grain of dust, on the glass window of that conscience. On entering the order of Saint Vincent de Paul, she had taken the name of Simplice by special choice. Simplice of Sicily, as we know, is the saint who preferred to allow both her breasts to be torn off, rather than to say that she had been born at Segesta, when she had been born at Syracuse. A lie which would have saved her. This patron saint suited this soul. Sister Simplice, on her entrance into the order, had had two faults, which she had gradually corrected. She had a taste for dainties, and she liked to receive letters. She never read anything but a book of prayers printed in Latin, in coarse type. She did not understand Latin, but she understood the book. This pious woman had conceived an affection for Fantine, probably feeling a latent virtue there, and she had devoted herself almost exclusively to her care. Monsieur Madeleine took Sister Simplice apart, and recommended Fantine to her in a singular tone, which the sister recalled later on. On leaving the sister, he approached Fantine. Fantine awaited Monsieur Madeleine's appearance every day, as one awaits a ray of warmth and joy. She said to the sisters, I only live when Monsieur le maire is here. She had a great deal of fever that day. As soon as she saw Monsieur Madeleine, she asked him, And Cosette? He replied with a smile, Soon. Monsieur Madeleine was the same as usual with Fantine, only he remained an hour instead of half an hour, to Fantine's great delight. He urged every one repeatedly not to allow the invalid to want for anything. It was noticed that there was a moment when his countenance became very sombre, but this was explained, when it became known that the doctor had bent down to his ear, and said to him, She is losing ground fast. Then he returned to the town hall, and the clerk observed him attentively, examining a road map of France which hung in his study. He wrote a few figures on a bit of paper with a pencil. End of Book 7 Chapter 1「Book Seven, Chapter Two of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Recording by Betty Greeby in Wapella, Illinois. Book 7, Chapter 2 The Perspicacity of Master Scoffliere From the town hall he betook himself to the extremity of the town, to a Fleming named Master Scoffliere, French Scoffliere, who led out 
horses and cabriolets as desired. In order to reach this scoffier, the shortest way was to take the little frequented street in which was situated the parsonage of the parish in which M. Madeline resided. The cure was, it was said, a worthy, respectable, and sensible man. At the moment when M. Madeline arrived in front of the parsonage, there was but one passer-by in the street, and this person noticed this. After the mayor had passed the priest's house, he halted, stood motionless, then turned about, and retraced his steps to the door of the parsonage, which had an iron knocker. He laid his hand quickly on the knocker and lifted it. Then he paused again and stopped short, as though in thought, and after the lapse of a few seconds, instead of allowing the knocker to fall abruptly, he placed it gently and resumed his way with a sort of haste which had not been apparent previously. M. Madeline found Master Scoffier at home, engaged in stitching a harness over. "'Master Scoffier,' he inquired, "'have you a good horse?' "'Mr. Mayor,' said the Fleming, "'all my horses are good. What do you mean by a good horse?' "'I mean a horse that can travel twenty leagues in a day.' "'The deuce!' said the Fleming. Twenty leagues! Yes. Hitch to a cabriolet! Yes. And how long can he rest at the end of his journey? He must be able to set out again on the next day, if necessary. To traverse the same road? Yes. The deuce! The deuce! And it is twenty leagues! M. Madeline drew from his pocket the paper on which he had penciled some figures. He showed it to the Fleming. The figures were five, six, eight and a half. You see, he said, total nineteen and a half, as well as say twenty leagues. Mr. Mayor, returned the Fleming, I have just what you want, my little white horse. You may have seen him pass occasionally. He is a small beast from Lower Boulonnais. He is full of fire. They wanted to make a saddle-horse of him at first. Bah! He reared, he kicked, he laid everybody flat on the ground. He was thought to be vicious, and no one knew what to do with him. I bought him. I harnessed him to a carriage. That is what he wanted, sir. He is as gentle as a girl. He goes like the wind. Ah! Indeed, he must not be mounted. It does not suit his ideas to be a saddle-horse. Every one has his ambition. Draw? Yes. Carry? No. We must suppose that is what he said to himself. And he will accomplish the trip? Your twenty leagues, all at a full trot, and in less than eight hours. But here are the conditions. State them. In the first place, you will give him half an hour's breathing, spell midway of the road. He will eat, and some one must be by while he is eating, to prevent the stable-boy of the inn from stealing his oats. For I have noticed in inns that oats are more often drunk by the stablemen than eaten by the horses. Someone will be by. In the second place, is the cabriolet for Monsieur le Maire? Yes. Does Monsieur le Maire know how to drive? Yes. Well, Monsieur le Maire will travel alone and without baggage, in order not to overload the horse. Agreed. But as Monsieur le Maire will have no one with him, he will be obliged to take the trouble himself of seeing that the oats are not stolen. That is understood. I am to have thirty francs a day, the days of rest to be paid for also, not a farthing less and the beast's food to be at Monsieur Le Maire's expense. M. Madeline drew three Napoleons from his purse and laid them on the table. Here is the pay for two days in advance. Fourthly, for such a journey, a cabriolet would be too heavy, and would fatigue the horse. Monsieur Le Maire must consent to travel in a little tilbury that I own. I consent to that. It is light, but it has no cover. That makes no difference to me. 
Has Monsieur le Maire reflected that we are in the middle of winter? M. Madeline did not reply. The Fleming resumed. That it is very cold. M. Madeline preserved silence. Master Scoffelier continued. That it may rain. M. Madeline raised his head and said, The Tilbury and the horse will be in front of my door tomorrow morning at half past four o'clock. Of course, Monsieur le Maire, replied Scoffelier. Then, scratching a speck in the wood of the table with his thumbnail, he resumed with that careless air which the Flemings understand so well how to mingle with their shrewdness. But this is what I am thinking now. Monsieur le Maire has not told me where he is going. Where is Monsieur le Maire going? He had been thinking of nothing else since the beginning of the conversation, but he did not know why he had not dared to put the question. "'Are your horse's four legs good?' said M. Madeline. "'Yes, Monsieur le Maire. You must hold him in a little when going downhill. Are there many descents between here and the place whither you are going?' "'Do not forget to be at my door at precisely half-past four o'clock tomorrow morning,' replied M. Madeline and he took his departure. The Fleming remained utterly stupid, as he himself said some time afterwards. The mayor had been gone two or three minutes when the door opened again. It was the mayor once more. He still wore the same impassive and preoccupied air. Monsieur Scoffelier, said he, at what sum do you estimate the value of the horse and Tilbury which you are to let me, the one bearing the other? The one dragging the other, Monsieur le Maire, said the Fleming, with a broad smile. So be it. Well? Does Monsieur le Maire wish to purchase them or me? No, but I wish to guarantee you in any case. You shall give me back the sum at my return. At what value do you estimate your horse and cabriolet? Five hundred francs, Monsieur le Maire. Here it is. M. Madeline laid a bank bill on the table, then left the room, and this time he did not return. Master Scoffelier experienced a frightful regret that he had not said a thousand francs. Besides, the horse and Tilbury together were worth a hundred crowns. The Fleming called his wife and related the affair to her. Where the devil could Monsieur Le Maire be going? They held counsel together. He is going to Paris said the wife. I don't believe it, said the husband. M. Madeline had forgotten the paper with the figures on it, and it lay on the chimney-piece. The Fleming picked it up and studied it. Five, six, eight and a half. That must designate the posting relays. He turned to his wife. I have found out. What? It is five leagues from here to Hesden, six from Hesden to St. Paul, Eight and a half from St. Paul to Arras. He is going to Arras. Meanwhile, M. Madeline had returned home. He had taken the longest way to return from Master Scoffelier's, as though the parsonage door had been a temptation for him, and he wished to avoid it. He ascended to his room, and there he shut himself up, which is a very simple act, since he liked going to bed early. Nevertheless, the portress of the factory, who was, at the same time, M. Madeline's only servant, noticed that the latter's light was extinguished at half-past eight, and she mentioned it to the cashier when he came home, adding, "'Is Monsieur Le Maire ill? I thought he had a rather singular air.' This cashier occupied a room situated directly under M. Madeline's chamber. He paid no heed to the portress's words but went to bed and to sleep. Towards midnight he woke with a start. In his sleep he had heard a noise above his head. He listened. It was a footstep pacing back and forth, as though someone were walking in the room above him. He listened more attentively, and recognized M. Madeline's step. This struck him as strange. Usually there was no noise in M. Madeline's chamber until he rose in the morning. A moment later the cashier heard a noise which resembled that of a cupboard being opened, and then shut again. Then a piece of furniture was disarranged. 
Then a pause ensued. Then the step began again. The cashier sat up in bed, quite awake now, and staring, and through his window panes he saw the reddish gleam of a lighted window reflected on the opposite wall. From the direction of the rays it could only come from the window of M. Madeline's chamber. The reflection wavered, as though it came rather from a fire which had been lighted than from a candle. The shadow of the window frame was not shown, which indicated that the window was wide open. The fact that this window was open in such cold weather was surprising. The cashier fell asleep again. An hour or two later he waked again. The same step was still passing slowly and regularly back and forth overhead. The reflection was still visible on the wall, but now it was pale and peaceful, like the reflection of a lamp or of a candle. The window was still open. This is what had taken place in M. Madeline's room. End of Book 7, Chapter 2 of Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Recording by Betty Greeby in Wapella, Illinois Book 7, Chapter 3 of Les Miserables Translated by Isabel F. Hapgood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, April 2008 Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Book 7 Chapter 3 A Tempest in a Skull The reader has no doubt already divined that Monsieur Madeleine is no other than Jean Valjean. We have already gazed into the depths of this conscience. The moment has now come when we must take another look into it. We do so not without emotion and trepidation. There is nothing more terrible in existence than this sort of contemplation. The eye of the spirit can nowhere find more dazzling brilliance and more shadow than in man. It can fix itself on no other thing which is more formidable more complicated, more mysterious, and more infinite. There is a spectacle more grand than the sea, it is heaven. There is a spectacle more grand than heaven, it is the inmost recesses of the soul. To make the poem of the human conscience, were it only with reference to a single man, were it only in connection with the basest of men, would be to blend all epics into one superior and definitive epic. Conscience is the chaos of chimeras, of lusts and of temptations, the furnace of dreams, the lair of ideas of which we are ashamed. It is the pandemonium of sophisms, it is the battlefield of the passions, penetrate at certain hours past the livid face of a human being who is engaged in reflection, and look behind, gaze into that soul, gaze into that obscurity. There beneath that external silence, Battles of giants, like those recorded in Homer, are in progress. Skirmishes of dragons and hydras and swarms of phantoms, as in Milton, visionary circles, as in Dante. What a solemn thing is this infinity, which every man bears within him, and which he measures with despair against the caprices of his brain and the actions of his life. Alighieri one day met with a sinister-looking door, before which he hesitated, here is one before us, upon whose threshold we hesitate. Let us enter, nevertheless. We have but little to add to what the reader already knows of what had happened to Jean Valjean after the adventure with little Gervais. From that moment forth he was, as we have seen, a totally different man. What the bishop had wished to make of him, that he carried out. It was more than a transformation, it was a transfiguration. He succeeded in disappearing, sold the bishop's silver, reserving only the candlesticks as a souvenir, crept from town to town, traversed France, came to M. sur M., conceived the idea which we have mentioned, accomplished what we have related, succeeded in rendering himself safe from seizure and inaccessible, 
and thenceforth established at M. sur M., happy in feeling his conscience, saddened by the past and the first half of his existence, belied by the last, he lived in peace, reassured and hopeful, having henceforth only two thoughts, to conceal his name and to sanctify his life, to escape men and to return to God. These two thoughts were so closely intertwined in his mind that they formed but a single one there. Both were equally absorbing and imperative, and ruled his slightest actions. In general, they conspired to regulate the conduct of his life. They turned him towards the gloom. They rendered him kindly and simple. They counseled him to the same things. Sometimes, however, they conflicted. In that case, as the reader will remember, the man whom all the country of M. sur M. called Monsieur Madeleine did not hesitate to sacrifice the first to the second, his security to his virtue. Thus, in spite of all his reserve and all his prudence, he had preserved the bishop's candlesticks, worn mourning for him, summoned and interrogated all the little Savoyards who passed that way, collected information regarding the families at Feverot, and saved old Fauchelevent's life, despite the disquieting insinuations of Javert. It seemed, as we have already remarked, as though he thought, following the example of all those who have been wise, holy, and just, that his first duty was not towards himself. At the same time it must be confessed, nothing just like this had yet presented itself. Never had the two ideas which governed the unhappy man, whose sufferings we are narrating, engaged in so serious a struggle. He understood this confusedly, but profoundly, at the very first words pronounced by Javert, when the latter entered his study. At the moment when that name, which he had buried beneath so many layers, was so strangely articulated, he was struck with stupor, and as though intoxicated with the sinister eccentricity of his destiny, and through this stupor he felt that shudder which precedes great shocks. He bent like an oak at the approach of a storm, like a soldier at the approach of an assault. He felt shadows filled with thunders and lightnings descending upon his head. As he listened to Javert, the first thought which occurred to him was to go, to run and denounce himself, to take that Champ Mathieu out of prison and place himself there. This was as painful and as poignant as an incision in the living flesh. Then it passed away, and he said to himself, We will see, we will see. He repressed this first generous instinct, and recoiled before heroism. It would be beautiful, no doubt, after the bishop's holy words, after so many years of repentance and abnegation, in the midst of a penitence admirably begun, if this man had not flinched for an instant, even in the presence of so terrible a conjecture, but had continued to walk with the same step towards this yawning precipice, at the bottom of which lay heaven, that would have been beautiful, but it was not thus. We must render an account of the things which went on in this soul, and we can only tell what there was there. He was carried away at first by the instinct of self-preservation. He rallied all his ideas in haste, stifled his emotions, took into consideration Javert's presence, that great danger, postponed all decision with the firmness of terror, shook off thought as to what he had to do, and resumed his calmness as a warrior picks up his buckler. He remained in this state during the rest of the day, a whirlwind within, a profound tranquillity without. He took no preservative measures, as they may be called. Everything was still confused, and jostling together in his brain. His trouble was so great that he could not perceive the form of a single idea distinctly, and he could have told nothing about himself, except that he had received a great blow. He repaired to Fantine's bed of suffering, as usual, and prolonged his visit, through a kindly instinct, telling himself that he must behave thus, and recommend her well to the sisters, in case he should be obliged to be absent himself. He had a vague feeling that he might be obliged to go to Arras, and without having the least in the world made up his mind to this trip, he said to himself that being as he was, beyond the shadows of any suspicion, 
there could be nothing out of the way in being a witness to what was to take place, and he engaged the Tilbury from Scaufflaire in order to be prepared in any event. He dined with a good deal of appetite. On returning to his room, he communed with himself. He examined the situation and found it unprecedented, so unprecedented that in the midst of his reverie he rose from his chair, moved by some inexplicable impulse of anxiety, and bolted his door. He feared lest something more should enter. He was barricading himself against possibilities. A moment later he extinguished his light. It embarrassed him. It seemed to him as though he might be seen. By whom? Alas, that on which he desired to close the door had already entered. That which he desired to blind was staring him in the face. His conscience. His conscience. That is to say, God. Nevertheless, he deluded himself at first. He had a feeling of security and of solitude. The bolt once drawn, he thought himself impregnable. The candle extinguished, he felt himself invisible. Then he took possession of himself. He set his elbows on the table, leaned his head on his hand, and began to meditate in the dark. Where do I stand? Am not I dreaming? What have I heard? Is it really true that I have seen that Javert, and that he spoke to me in that manner? Who can that Champ Mathieu be? So he resembles me. Is it possible? When I reflect that yesterday I was so tranquil, and so far from suspecting anything. What was I doing yesterday at this hour? What is there in this incident? What will the end be? What is to be done? This was the torment in which he found himself. His brain had lost its power of retaining ideas. They passed like waves, and he clutched his brow in both hands to arrest them. Nothing but anguish extricated itself from this tumult, which overwhelmed his will and his reason, and from which he sought to draw proof and resolution. His head was burning. He went to the window and threw it wide open. There were no stars in the sky. He returned and seated himself at the table. The first hour passed in this manner. Gradually, however, vague outlines began to take form and to fix themselves in his meditation, and he was able to catch a glimpse with precision of the reality, not the whole situation, but some of the details. He began by recognizing the fact that, critical and extraordinary as was this situation, he was completely master of it. This only caused an increase of his stupor. Independently of the severe and religious aim which he had assigned to his actions, all that he had made up to that day had been nothing but a hole in which to bury his name. That which he had always feared most of all in his hours of self-communion during his sleepless nights, was to ever hear that name pronounced. He had said to himself that that would be the end of all things for him, that on the day when that name made its reappearance it would cause his new life to vanish from about him, and who knows, perhaps even his new soul within him also. He shuddered at the very thought that this was possible. Assuredly, if any one had said to him at such moments that the hour would come when that name would ring in his ears, when the hideous words Jean Valjean would suddenly emerge from the darkness and rise in front of him, when that formidable light, capable of dissipating the mystery in which he had enveloped himself, would suddenly blaze forth above his head, and that that name would not menace him, that that light would but produce an obscurity more dense, that this rent veil would but increase the mystery, that this earthquake would solidify his edifice, that this prodigious incident would have no other result, so far as he was concerned, if so it seemed good to him, than that of rendering his existence at once clearer and more impenetrable, and that, out of his confrontation with the phantom of Jean Valjean, the good and worthy citizen, Monsieur Madeleine, would emerge more honoured, more peaceful, and more respected than ever. If any one had told him that, he would have tossed his head and regarded the words as those of a madman. Well, all this was precisely what had just come to pass. All that accumulation of impossibilities was a fact, and God had permitted these wild fancies to become real things. His reverie continued to grow clearer. He came more and more to an understanding of his position. 
It seemed to him that he had but just waked up from some inexplicable dream, and that he found himself slipping down a declivity in the middle of the night, erect, shivering, holding back all in vain, on the very brink of the abyss. He distinctly perceived in the darkness a stranger, a man unknown to him, whom destiny had mistaken for him, and whom she was thrusting into the gulf in his stead, in order that the gulf might close once more, it was necessary that some one, himself or that other man, should fall into it. He had only let things take their course. The light became complete, and he acknowledged this to himself, that his place was empty in the galleys, that do what he would it was still awaiting him, that the theft from little Gervais had led him back to it, that this vacant place would await him, and draw him on until he filled it, that this was inevitable and fatal. And then he said to himself that at this moment he had a substitute, that it appeared that a certain Jean Mathieu had that ill luck, and that, as regards himself, being present in the galleys in the person of that Jean Mathieu, present in society under the name of Monsieur Madeleine, he had nothing more to fear, provided that he did not prevent men from sealing over the head of that Jean Mathieu this stone of infamy which, like the stone of the sepulchre, falls once, never to rise again. All this was so strange and so violent that there suddenly took place in him that indescribable movement which no man feels more than two or three times in the course of his life, a sort of convulsion of the conscience which stirs up all that there is doubtful in the heart, which is composed of irony, of joy and of despair, and which may be called an outburst of inward laughter. He hastily relighted his candle. "'Well, what then?' he said to himself. "'What am I afraid of? What is there in all that for me to think about? I am safe. All is over. I had but one partly open door through which my past might invade my life, and behold that door is walled up for ever. That Javert, who has been annoying me so long, that terrible instinct which seemed to have divined me, which had divined me, good God, and which followed me everywhere, that frightful hunting-dog, always making a point at me, is thrown off the scent, engaged elsewhere, absolutely turned from the trail. Henceforth he is satisfied, he will leave me in peace, he has his Jean Valjean. Who knows? It is even probable that he will wish to leave town. And all this has been brought about without any aid from me, and I count for nothing in it. Ah! but where is the misfortune in this? Upon my honour, people would think, to see me, that some catastrophe had happened to me. After all, if it does bring harm to someone, that is not my fault in the least. It is Providence which has done it all. It is because it wishes it so to be, evidently. Have I the right to disarrange what it has arranged? What do I ask now? Why should I meddle? It does not concern me, what I am not satisfied, but what more do I want? The goal to which I have aspired for so many years, the dream of my nights, the object of my prayers to heaven, security, I have now attained. It is God who wills it, I can do nothing against the will of God, and why does God will it? In order that I may continue what I have begun, that I may do good, that I may one day be a grand and encouraging example, that it may be said at last that a little happiness has been attached to the penance which I have undergone, and to that virtue to which I have returned. Really I do not understand why I was afraid, a little while ago, to enter the house of that good cure, and to ask his advice. This is evidently what he would have said to me. It is settled. Let things take their course. Let the good God do as he likes." Thus did he address himself in the depths of his own conscience, bending over what may be called his own abyss. He rose from his chair, and began to pace the room. Come, said he, let us think no more about it. My resolve is taken. But he felt no joy. Quite the reverse. One can no more prevent thought from recurring to an idea than one can the sea from returning to the shore. The sailor calls it the tide, the guilty man calls it remorse. God upheaves the soul as he does the ocean. After the expiration of a few moments, 
do what he would, he resumed the gloomy dialogue in which it was he who spoke, and he who listened, saying that which he would have preferred to ignore, and listened to that which he would have preferred not to hear, yielding to that mysterious power which said to him, Think, as it said to another condemned man two thousand years ago, March on. Before proceeding further, and in order to make ourselves fully understood, let us insist upon one necessary observation. It is certain that people do talk to themselves. There is no living being who has not done it. It may even be said that the word is never a more magnificent mystery than when it goes from thought to conscience within a man, and when it returns from conscience to thought. It is in this sense only that the words so often employed in this chapter, he said, he exclaimed, must be understood. One speaks to one's self, talks to one's self, exclaims to one's self, without breaking the external silence. There is a great tumult. Everything about us talks except the mouth. The realities of the soul are none the less realities, because they are not visible and palpable. So he asked himself where he stood. He interrogated himself upon that settled resolve. He confessed to himself that all that he had just arranged in his mind was monstrous, that to let things take their course, to let the good God do as he liked, was simply horrible. To allow this error of fate and of men to be carried out, not to hinder it, to lend himself to it through his silence, to do nothing, in short, was to do everything, that this was hypocritical baseness in the last degree, that it was a base, cowardly, sneaking, abject, hideous crime. For the first time in eight years the wretched man had just tasted the bitter savour of an evil thought and of an evil action. He spit it out with disgust. He continued to question himself. He asked himself severely what he had meant by this. My object is attained. He declared to himself that his life really had an object. But what object? To conceal his name? To deceive the police? Was it for so petty a thing that he had done all that he had done? Had he not another and a grand object, which was the true one? To save not his person, but his soul? To become honest and good once more? To be a just man? Was it not that above all, that alone, which he had always desired, which the bishop had enjoined upon him, to shut the door on his past? But he was not shutting it, Great God, he was reopening it by committing an infamous action. He was becoming a thief once more, and the most odious of thieves. He was robbing another of his existence, his life, his peace, his place in the sunshine. He was becoming an assassin. He was murdering, morally murdering, a wretched man. He was inflicting on him that frightful living death, that death beneath the open sky, which is called the galleys. On the other hand, to surrender himself to save that man, struck down with so melancholy an error, to resume his own name, to become once more out of duty, the convict Jean Valjean, that was, in truth, to achieve his resurrection, and to close forever that hell whence he had just emerged. To fall back there in appearance was to escape from it in reality. This must be done. He had done nothing if he did not do all this. His whole life was useless. All his penitence was wasted. There was no longer any need of saying, What is the use? He felt that the bishop was there, that the bishop was present, all the more because he was dead, that the bishop was gazing fixedly at him, that henceforth Mayor Madeleine, with all his virtues, would be abominable to him, and that the convict Jean Valjean would be pure and admirable in his sight, that men beheld his mask, but that the bishop saw his face, that men saw his life, but that the bishop beheld his conscience. So he must go to Arras, and deliver the false Jean Valjean, and denounce the real one. Alas, that was the greatest of sacrifices, the most poignant of victories, the last step to take, but it must be done. Sad fate, he would enter into sanctity, only in the eyes of God, when he returned to infamy, in the eyes of men. Well, said he, let us decide upon this, let us do our duty, let us save this man. He uttered these words aloud,
without perceiving that he was speaking aloud. He took his books, verified them, and put them in order. He flung in the fire a bundle of bills which he had against petty and embarrassed tradesmen. He wrote and sealed a letter, and on the envelope it might have been read, had there been any one in his chamber at the moment, to Monsieur Lafitte, banker, Rue d'Artois, Paris. He drew from his secretary a pocket-book, which contained several banknotes, and the passport of which he had made use that same year when he went to the elections. Any one who had seen him during the execution of these various acts, into which there entered such grave thought, would have had no suspicion of what was going on within him. Only occasionally did his lips move, at other times he raised his head and fixed his gaze upon some point of the wall as though there existed at that point something which he wished to elucidate or interrogate. When he had finished the letter to M. Lafitte, he put it into his pocket, together with the pocket-book, and began his walk once more. His reverie had not swerved from its course. He continued to see his duty clearly, written in luminous letters, which flamed before his eyes, and changed its place, as he altered the direction of his glance. Go! tell your name, denounce yourself. In the same way he beheld, as though they had passed before him in visible forms, the two ideas which had, up to that time, formed the double rule of his soul, the concealment of his name, the sanctification of his life. For the first time they appeared to him as absolutely distinct, and he perceived the distance which separated them. He recognized the fact that one of these ideas was necessarily good, while the other might become bad, that the first was self-devotion, and that the other was personality, that the one said, My neighbor, and that the other said, Myself, that one emanated from the light, and the other from darkness. They were antagonistic, he saw them in conflict, in proportion as he meditated, they grew before the eyes of his spirit, they had now attained colossal statures, and it seemed to him that he beheld within himself in that infinity of which we were recently speaking, in the midst of the darkness and the lights, a goddess and a giant contending. He was filled with terror, but it seemed to him that the good thought was getting the upper hand. He felt that he was on the brink of the second decisive crisis of his conscience and of his destiny, that the bishop had marked the first phase of his new life, and that Champ Mathieu marked the second, after the grand crisis the grand test. But the fever, allayed for an instant, gradually resumed possession of him. A thousand thoughts traversed his mind, but they continued to fortify him in his resolution. One moment he said to himself that he was, perhaps, taking the matter too keenly, that, after all, this Champ Mathieu was not interesting, and that he had actually been guilty of theft. He answered himself, if this man has, indeed, stolen a few apples, that means a month in prison. It is a long way from that to the galleys. And who knows? Did he steal? Has it been proved? The name of Jean Valjean overwhelms him, and seems to dispense with proofs. Do not the attorneys for the crown always proceed in this manner? He is supposed to be a thief because he is known to be a convict. In another instant the thought had occurred to him that, when he denounced himself, the heroism of his deed might, perhaps, be taken into consideration, and his honest life for the last seven years, and what he had done for the district, and that they would have mercy on him. But this supposition vanished very quickly, and he smiled bitterly as he remembered that the theft of the forty sous from little Gervais put him in the position of a man guilty of a second offence after conviction, that this affair would certainly come up, and according to the precise terms of the law, would render him liable to penal servitude for life. He turned aside from all illusions, detached himself more and more from earth, and sought strength and consolation elsewhere. He told himself that he must do his duty, that perhaps he should not be more unhappy after doing his duty than after having avoided it, that if he allowed things to take their own course, if he remained at M. sur M., his consideration, his good name, his good works, the deference and veneration paid to him, his charity, his wealth, his popularity, his virtue, would be seasoned with a crime. 
and what would be the taste of all these holy things when bound up with this hideous thing, while, if he accomplished his sacrifice, a celestial idea would be mingled with the galleys, the post, the iron necklet, the green cap, unceasing toil, and pitiless shame. At length he told himself that it must be so, that his destiny was thus allotted, that he had not authority to alter the arrangements made on high, that in any case he must make his choice, virtue without, and abomination within, or holiness within, and infamy without. The stirring of these lugubrious ideas did not cause his courage to fail, but his brain grow weary. He began to think of other things, of indifferent matters, in spite of himself. The veins in his temples throbbed violently, he still paced to and fro, Midnight sounded first from the parish church, then from the town hall. He counted the twelve strokes of the two clocks, and compared the sound of the two bells. He recalled in this connection the fact that, a few days previously, he had seen in an ironmonger's shop an ancient clock for sale, upon which was written the name, Antoine Albin de Romainville. He was cold. He lighted a small fire. It did not occur to him to close the window. In the meantime he had relapsed into his stupor. He was obliged to make a tolerably vigorous effort to recall what had been the subject of his thoughts before midnight had struck. He finally succeeded in doing this. Ah, yes, he said to himself, I had resolved to inform against myself. And then, all of a sudden, he thought of Fantine. Hold, said he, and what about that poor woman? Here a fresh crisis declared itself. Fantine, by appearing thus abruptly in his reverie, produced the effect of an unexpected ray of light. It seemed to him as though everything about him were undergoing a change of aspect. He exclaimed, Ah, but I have hitherto considered no one but myself. It is proper for me to hold my tongue, or to denounce myself, to conceal my person, or to save my soul, to be a despicable and respected magistrate, or an infamous and venerable convict. It is I, it is always I, and nothing but I. But, good God, all this is egotism. These are diverse forms of egotism. But it is egotism all the same. What if I were to think a little about others? The highest holiness is to think of others. Come, let us examine the matter. The I accepted, the I effaced, the I forgotten. What would be the result of all this? What if I denounce myself? I am arrested. This Champ Mathieu is released. I am put back in the galleys. That is well. And what then? What is going on here? Ah, here is a country, a town. Here are factories, an industry, workers, both men and women, aged grandsires, children, poor people. All this I have created. All these I provide with their living, everywhere where there is a smoking chimney. It is I who have placed the brand on the hearth and meat in the pot. I have created ease, circulation, credit. Before me there was nothing. I have elevated, vivified, informed with life, fecundated, stimulated, enriched the whole countryside. Lacking me, the soul is lacking. I take myself off, everything dies. And this woman, who has suffered so much, who possesses so many merits in spite of her fall, the cause of all whose misery I have unwittingly been, and that child whom I meant to go in search of, whom I have promised to her mother. Do I not also owe something to this woman, in reparation for the evil which I have done her? If I disappear, what happens? The mother dies, the child becomes what it can. That is what will take place, if I denounce myself. If I do not denounce myself, come, let us see how it will be, if I do not denounce myself. After putting this question to himself, he paused. He seemed to undergo a momentary hesitation and trepidation, but it did not last long, and he answered himself calmly, Well, this man is going to the galleys, it is true, but what the deuce, he has stolen. There is no use in my saying that he has not been guilty of theft, for he has. I remain here, I go on. In ten years I shall have made ten millions, I scatter them over the country, I have nothing of my own, what is that to me? It is not for myself that I am doing it. The prosperity of all goes on augmenting. 
industries are aroused and animated, factories and shops are multiplied, families, a hundred families, a thousand families are happy. The district becomes populated, villages spring up where there were only farms before. Farms rise where there was nothing, wretchedness disappears, and with wretchedness debauchery, prostitution, theft, murder, all vices disappear, all crimes, and this poor mother rears her child, and behold a whole country, rich and honest. Ah, I was a fool, I was absurd, what was that I was saying about denouncing myself? I really must pay attention, and not be precipitate about anything." What, because it would have pleased me to play the grand and generous, this is melodrama, after all, because I should have thought of no one but myself, the idea, for the sake of saving from a punishment, a trifle exaggerated, perhaps, but just at bottom, no one knows whom, a thief, a good-for-nothing, evidently a whole countryside must perish. A poor woman must die in the hospital, a poor little girl must die in the street, like dogs, Ah, this is abominable! And without the mother, even having seen her child once more, almost without the child's having known her mother, and all that for the sake of an old wretch of an apple-thief, who most assuredly has deserved the galleys for something else, if not for that. Fine scruples indeed which save a guilty man, and sacrifice the innocent, which save an old vagabond, who has only a few years to live at most, and who will not be more unhappy in the galleys than in his hovel, and which sacrifice a whole population, mothers, wives, children. This poor little Cosette, who has no one in the world but me, and who is, no doubt, blue with cold at this moment in the den of those Thernadiers, those peoples are rascals, and I was going to neglect my duty towards all these poor creatures, and I was going off to denounce myself, and I was about to commit that unspeakable folly. Let us put it at the worst. Suppose that there is a wrong action on my part in this, and that my conscience will reproach me for it some day, to accept, for the good of others, these reproaches which weigh only on myself, this evil action which compromises my soul alone, in that lies self-sacrifice, in that alone there is virtue. He rose and resumed his march. This time he seemed to be content." Diamonds are found only in the dark places of the earth. Truths are found only in the depths of thought. It seemed to him that, after having descended into these depths, after having long groped among the darkest of these shadows, he had at last found one of these diamonds, one of these truths, and that he now held it in his hand, and he was dazzled as he gazed upon it. Yes, he thought, this is right. I am on the right road. I have the solution. I must end by holding fast to something. My resolve is taken. Let things take their course. Let us no longer vacillate. Let us no longer hang back. This is for the interest of all, not for my own. I am Madeleine, and Madeleine I remain. Woe to the man who is Jean Valjean. I am no longer he. I do not know that man. I no longer know anything. It turns out that someone is Jean Valjean at the present moment. Let him look out for himself that does not concern me. It is a fatal name which was floating abroad in the night. If it halts and descends on a head, so much the worse for that head. He looked into the little mirror which hung above his chimney-piece, and said, Hold, it has relieved me to come to a decision. I am quite another man now. He proceeded a few paces further, then he stopped short. Come, he said, I must not flinch before any of the consequences of the resolution which I have once adopted. There are still threads which attach me to that Jean Valjean. They must be broken. In this very room there are objects which would betray me, dumb things which would bear witness against me. It is settled. All these things must disappear. He fumbled in his pocket, drew out his purse, opened it, and took out a small key. He inserted the key in a lock whose aperture could hardly be seen so hidden was it in the most sombre tones of the design which covered the wallpaper. A secret receptacle opened, a sort of false cupboard, constructed in the angle between the wall and the chimney-piece. In this hiding-place there were some rags, a blue linen blouse, an old pair of trousers, an old knapsack, and a huge thorn cudgel, shod with iron at both ends. Those who had seen Jean Valjean at the epoch 
when he passed through D, in October 1815, could easily have recognized all the pieces of this miserable outfit. He had preserved them as he had preserved the silver candlesticks, in order to remind himself continually of his starting point, but he had concealed all that came from the galleys, and he had allowed the candlesticks which came from the bishop to be seen. He cast a furtive glance towards the door, as though he feared that it would open in spite of the bolt which fastened it. Then, with a quick and abrupt movement, he took the whole in his arms at once, without bestowing so much as a glance on the things which he had so religiously and so perilously preserved for so many years, and flung them all, rags, cudgel, knapsack, into the fire. He closed the false cupboard again, and with redoubled precautions, henceforth unnecessary, since it was now empty, he concealed the door behind a heavy piece of furniture, which he pushed in front of it. After the lapse of a few seconds, the room and the opposite wall were lighted up with a fierce, red, tremendous glow. Everything was on fire. The thorn cudgel snapped and threw its sparks to the middle of the chamber. As the knapsack was consumed, together with the hideous rags which it contained, it revealed something which sparkled in the ashes. By bending over, one could have readily recognized a coin, no doubt the forty-sou piece stolen from the little Savillard. He did not look at the fire, but paced back and forth with the same step. All at once his eye fell on the two silver candlesticks, which shone vaguely on the chimney-piece through the glow. Hold! he thought. The whole of Jean Valjean is still in them. They must be destroyed also. He seized the two candlesticks. There was still fire enough to allow of their being put out of shape, and converted into a sort of unrecognizable bar of metal. He bent over the hearth and warmed himself for a moment. He felt a sense of real comfort. How good warmth is, said he. He stirred the live coals with one of the candlesticks. A minute more, and they were both in the fire. At that moment it seemed to him that he heard a voice within him shouting, Jean Valjean! Jean Valjean! His hair rose upright. He became like a man who was listening to some terrible thing. Yes, that's it. Finish, said the voice. Complete what you are about. Destroy these candlesticks. Annihilate this souvenir. Forget the bishop. Forget everything. Destroy this Champmathieu. Do. That is right. Applaud yourself. So it is settled. Resolved. Fixed. Agreed. Here is an old man who does not know what is wanted of him, who has perhaps done nothing, an innocent man, whose whole misfortune lies in your name, upon whom your name weighs like a crime, who is about to be taken for you, who will be condemned, who will finish his days in abjectness and horror. That is good. Be an honest man yourself. Remain Monsieur le Maire. Remain honourable and honoured. Enrich the town, nourish the indigent, rear the orphan, live happy, virtuous, and admired, and during this time, while you are here in the midst of joy and light, there will be a man who will wear your red blouse, who will bear your name in ignominy, and who will drag your chain in the galleys. Yes, it is well arranged thus. Ah, wretch! The perspiration streamed from his brow. He fixed a haggard eye on the candlesticks, but that within him which had spoken had not finished. The voice continued. Jean Valjean, there will be around you many voices, which will make a great noise, which will talk very loud, and which will bless you, and only one which no one will hear, and which will curse you in the dark. Well, listen, infamous man, all those benedictions will fall back before they reach heaven, and only the malediction will ascend to God. This voice, feeble at first, and which had proceeded from the most obscure depths of his conscience, had gradually become startling and formidable, and he now heard it in his very ear. It seemed to him that it had detached itself from him, and that it was now speaking outside of him. He thought that he heard the last words so distinctly that he glanced around the room in a sort of terror. "'Is there any one here?' he demanded aloud, in utter bewilderment. Then he resumed with a laugh which resembled that of an idiot. "'How stupid I am! There can be no one!' There was someone, but the person who was there was of those whom the human eye cannot see. He placed the candlesticks on the chimney-piece. Then he resumed his monotonous and lugubrious tramp, which troubled the dreams of the sleeping man beneath him, 
and awoke him with a start. This tramping to and fro soothed, and at the same time intoxicated him. It sometimes seems, on supreme occasions, as though people moved about for the purpose of asking advice of everything that they may encounter by change of place. After the lapse of a few minutes, he no longer knew his position. He now recoiled in equal terror before both the resolutions at which he had arrived in turn. The two ideas which counseled him appeared to him equally fatal. What a fatality! What conjunction that that Chant Mathieu should have been taken for him, to be overwhelmed by precisely the means which Providence seemed to have employed, at first to strengthen his position. There was a moment when he reflected on the future. Denounce himself, great God, deliver himself up. With immense despair he faced all that he should be obliged to leave, all that he should be obliged to take up once more. He should have to bid farewell to that existence, which was so good, so pure, so radiant, to the respect of all, to honour, to liberty. He should never more stroll in the fields, he should never more hear the birds sing in the month of May, he should never more bestow alms on the little children, he should never more experience the sweetness of having glances of gratitude and love fixed upon him. He should quit that house which he had built, that little chamber. Everything seemed charming to him at that moment. Never again should he read those books. Never more should he write on that little table of white wood, his old portress, the only servant whom he kept, would never more bring him his coffee in the morning. Great God! Instead of that, the convict gang— the iron necklet, the red waistcoat, the chain on his ankle, fatigue, the cell, the camp-bed, all those horrors which he knew so well. At his age, after having been what he was, if he were only young again, but to be addressed in his old age as thou, by any one who pleased, to be searched by the convict guard, to receive the galley sergeant's cudgelings, to wear iron-bound shoes on his bare feet, to have to stretch out his leg night and morning to the hammer of the roundsman who visits the gang, to submit to the curiosity of strangers who would be told, that man yonder is the famous Jean Valjean, who was mayor of M. sur M., and at night, dripping with perspiration, overwhelmed with lassitude, their green caps drawn over their eyes, to remount, two by two, the ladder staircase of the galleys beneath the sergeant's whip. Oh, what misery! Can destiny, then, be as malicious as an intelligent being, and become as monstrous as the human heart? And do what he would, he always fell back upon the heart-rending dilemma which lay at the foundation of his reverie. Should he remain in paradise and become a demon? Should he return to hell and become an angel? What was to be done? Great God, what was to be done? The torment from which he had escaped with so much difficulty was unchained afresh within him. His ideas began to grow confused once more. They assumed a kind of stupefied and mechanical quality which is peculiar to despair. The name of Romavi recurred incessantly to his mind, with the two verses of a song which he had heard in the past. He thought that Romavi was a little grove near Paris where young lovers go to pluck lilacs in the month of April. He wavered outwardly as well as inwardly. He walked like a little child who is permitted to toddle alone. At intervals, as he combated his lassitude, he made an effort to recover the mastery of his mind. He tried to put to himself, for the last time, and definitely the problem over which he had, in a manner, fallen prostrate with fatigue. Ought he to denounce himself? Ought he to hold his peace? He could not manage to see anything distinctly the vague aspects of all the courses of reasoning which had been sketched out by his meditations, quivered and vanished, one after the other, into smoke. He only felt that, to whatever course of action he made up in his mind, something in him must die, and that of necessity, and without his being able to escape the fact that he was entering a sepulchre on the right hand, as much as on the left, that he was passing through a death agony, the agony of his happiness, or the agony of his virtue. Alas, all his resolution had again taken possession of him. He was no further advanced than at the beginning. Thus did the unhappy soul struggle in its anguish. 
eighteen hundred years before this unfortunate man, the mysterious being, in whom are summed up all the sanctities and all the sufferings of humanity, had also long thrust aside with his hand, while the olive trees quivered in the wild wind of the infinite, the terrible cup which appeared to him dripping with darkness, and overflowing with shadows in the depths, all studded with stars. End of Book 7 Chapter 3Book Seven, Chapter Four of Les Miserables. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. Book Seven, The Champmathieu Affair, Chapter Four. Forms assumed by suffering during sleep. Three o'clock in the morning had just struck, and he had been walking thus for five hours, almost uninterruptedly, when he at length allowed himself to drop into his chair. There he fell asleep and had a dream. This dream, like the majority of dreams, bore no relation to the situation, except by its painful and heart-rending character but it made an impression on him. This nightmare struck him so forcibly that he wrote it down later on. It is one of the papers in his own handwriting which he has bequeathed to us. We think that we have here reproduced the thing in strict accordance with the text. Of whatever nature this dream may be, the history of this night would be incomplete if we were to omit it. It is the gloomy adventure of an ailing soul. Here it is. On the envelope we find this line inscribed, The dream I had that night. I was in a plain, a vast gloomy plain, where there was no grass. It did not seem to me to be daylight, nor yet night. I was walking with my brother, the brother of my childish years, the brother of whom I must say I never think, and whom I now hardly remember. We were conversing, and we met some passers-by. We were talking of a neighbor of ours in former days, who had always worked with her window open from the time when she came to live on the street. As we talked, we felt cold because of that open window. There were no trees in the plain. We saw a man passing close to us. He was entirely nude, of the hue of ashes, and mounted on a horse which was earth color. The man had no hair. We could see his skull and the veins on it. In his hand he held a switch, which was as supple as a vine shoot, and as heavy as iron. This horseman passed and said nothing to us. My brother said to me, Let us take the hollow road. There existed a hollow way wherein one saw neither a single shrub nor a spear of moss. Everything was dirt-colored, even the sky. After proceeding a few paces, I received no reply when I spoke. I perceived that my brother was no longer with me. I entered a village which I espied. I reflected that it must be Romainville. Why Romainville? The first street that I entered was deserted. I entered a second street. Behind the angle formed by the two streets, a man was standing erect against the wall. I said this to the man. What country is this? Where am I? The man made no reply. I saw the door of a house open, and I entered. The first chamber was deserted. I entered the second. Behind the door of this chamber, a man was standing erect against the wall. I inquired of this man, Whose house is this? Where am I? The man replied not. The house had a garden. I quitted the house and entered the garden. The garden was deserted. Behind the first tree, I found a man standing upright. I said to this man, What garden is this? Where am I? The man did not answer. I strolled into the village and perceived that it was a town. All the streets were deserted, all the doors were open. Not a single living being was passing in the streets, walking through the chambers, or strolling in the gardens. 
but behind each angle of the walls, behind each door, behind each tree, stood a silent man. Only one was to be seen at a time. These men watched me pass. I left the town and began to ramble about the fields. After the lapse of some time, I turned back and saw a great crowd coming up behind me. I recognized all the men whom I had seen in that town. They had strange heads. They did not seem to be in a hurry, yet they walked faster than I did. They made no noise as they walked. In an instant this crowd had overtaken and surrounded me. The faces of these men were earthen in hue. The first one whom I had seen and questioned on entering the town said to me, "'Whither are you going? Do you not know that you have been dead this long time?' I opened my mouth to reply, and I perceived that there was no one near me. He woke. He was icy cold. A wind which was chill like the breeze of dawn was rattling the leaves of the window, which had been left open on their hinges. The fire was out. The candle was nearing its end. It was still black night. He rose. He went to the window. There were no stars in the sky even yet. From his window, the yard of the house and the street were visible. A sharp, harsh noise, which made him drop his eyes, resounded from the earth. Below him he perceived two red stars, whose rays lengthened and shortened in a singular manner through the darkness. As his thoughts were still half immersed in the mists of sleep, Hold, said he, there are no stars in the sky, they are on earth now but this confusion vanished. A second sound, similar to the first, roused him thoroughly. He looked and recognized the fact that these two stars were the lanterns of a carriage. By the light which they cast, he was able to distinguish the form of this vehicle. It was a tilbury harnessed to a small white horse. The noise which he had heard was the trampling of the horse's hoofs on the pavement. "'What vehicle is this?' he said to himself. Who is coming here so early in the morning? At that moment there came a light tap on the door of his chamber. He shuddered from head to foot and cried in a terrible voice, Who is there? Someone said, I, Monsieur le Maire. He recognized the voice of the old woman who was his portress. Well, he replied, what is it? Monsieur le Maire, it is just five o'clock in the morning. What is that to me? The cabriolet is here, Monsieur le Maire. What cabriolet? The Tilbury. What Tilbury? Did not Monsieur le Maire order a Tilbury? No, said he. The coachman says that he has come for Monsieur le Maire. What coachman? Monsieur Scaufflaire's coachman. Monsieur Scaufflaire? That name sent a shudder over him, as though a flash of lightning had passed in front of his face. Ah, yes, he resumed. Monsieur Scaufflaire. If the old woman could have seen him at that moment, she would have been frightened. A tolerably long silence ensued. He examined the flame of the candle with a stupid air and from around the wick he took some of the burning wax which he rolled between his fingers. The old woman waited for him. She even ventured to uplift her voice once more. What am I to say, Monsieur le Maire? Say that it is well, and that I am coming down. End of Book 7, Chapter 4《Book Seven, Chapter Five of Les Misérables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tamara Hamilton. Les Misérables by Victor Hugo, Book Seven, The Chaumatieu Affair, Chapter Five, Hindrances. The posting service from Arras to montreuil sur mer was still operated at this period by small mail-wagons of the time of the Empire. These mail-wagons were two-wheeled cabriolets, upholstered inside with fawn-colored leather, hung on springs, 
and having but two seats, one for the post-boy, the other for the traveller. The wheels were armed with those long, offensive axles which keep other vehicles at a distance, and which may still be seen on the road in Germany. The dispatch box, an immense oblong coffer, was placed behind the vehicle and formed a part of it. This coffer was painted black, and the cabriolet yellow. These vehicles, which have no counterparts nowadays, had something distorted and hunchbacked about them, and when one saw them passing in the distance and climbing up some road to the horizon, they resembled the insects which are called, I think, termites, and which, though with but little corslet, drag a great train behind them. But they travelled at a very rapid rate. The post-wagon which set out from Arras at one o'clock every night, after the mail from Paris had passed, arrived at montreuil sur mer a little before five o'clock in the morning. That night the wagon which was descending to montreuil sur mer by the Hesden Road collided at the corner of a street, just as it was entering the town, with a little tilbury harnessed to a white horse, which was going in the opposite direction, and in which there was but one person, a man, enveloped in a mantle. The wheel of the tilbury received quite a violent shock. The postman shouted to the man to stop, but the traveller paid no heed, and pursued his road at full gallop. "'That man is in a devilish hurry,' said the postman. The man thus hastening on was the one whom we have just seen struggling in convulsions which are certainly deserving of pity. Whither was he going? He could not have told. Why was he hastening? He did not know. He was driving at random, straight ahead. Whither? To Arras, no doubt. But he might have been going elsewhere as well. At times he was conscious of it, and he shuddered. He plunged into the night as into a gulf. Something urged him forward. Something drew him on. No one could have told what was taking place within him. Everyone will understand it. What man is there who has not entered, at least once in his life, into that obscure cavern of the unknown? However, he had resolved on nothing, decided nothing, formed no plan, done nothing. None of the actions of his conscience had been decisive. He was, more than ever, as he had been at the first moment. Why was he going to Arras? He repeated what he had already said to himself when he had hired Scaufflaire's cabriolet, that, whatever the result was to be, there was no reason why he should not see with his own eyes, and judge of matters for himself, that this was even prudent, that he must know what took place, that no decision could be arrived at without having observed and scrutinized, that one made mountains out of everything from a distance, that, at any rate, when he should have seen that Chalmathieu, some wretch, his conscience would probably be greatly relieved to allow him to go to the galleys in his stead, that Javert would indeed be there, and that Brevet, that Chinildieu, that Cochepaille, old convicts who had known him. But they certainly would not recognize him. Pa! what an idea! That Javert was a hundred leagues from suspecting the truth, that all conjectures and all suppositions were fixed on Chalmathieu, and that there is nothing so headstrong as suppositions and conjectures, that accordingly there was no danger. That it was no doubt a dark moment, but that he should emerge from it. That after all he held his destiny, however bad it might be, in his own hand. That he was master of it. He clung to this thought. At bottom, to tell the whole truth, he would have preferred not to go to Arras. Nevertheless, he was going thither. As he meditated, he whipped up his horse, which was proceeding at that fine, regular, and even trot, which accomplishes two leagues in a half an hour. In proportion as the cabriolet advanced, he felt something within him draw back. At daybreak he was in the open country. The town of montreuil sur mer lay far behind him. He watched the horizon grow white. He stared at all the chilly figures of a winter's dawn as they passed before his eyes, but without seeing them. The morning has its specters as well as the evening. He did not see them. But without his being aware of it, and by means of a sort of penetration which was almost physical, these black silhouettes of trees and of hills added some gloomy and sinister quality to the violent state of his soul. Each time that he passed one of those isolated dwellings which sometimes border on the highway, he said to himself, And yet there are people there within who are sleeping. The trot of the horse, the bells on the harness, the wheels on the road, produced a gentle, monotonous noise. These things are charming when one is joyous, and lugubrious when one is sad. It was broad daylight when he arrived at Hesden. He halted in front of the inn to allow the horse a breathing spell, and to have him given some oats. The horse belonged, as Scoffler had said, to that small race of the Boulonnais, 
which has too much head, too much belly, and not enough neck and shoulders, but which has a broad chest, a large crupper, thin, fine legs, and solid hoofs, a homely but a robust and healthy race. The excellent beast had traveled five leagues in two hours, and had not a drop of sweat on his loins. He did not get out of the tilbury. The stableman who brought the oats suddenly bent down and examined the left wheel. "'Are you going far in this condition?' said the man. He replied, with an air of not having roused himself from his reverie, "'Why? Have you come from a great distance?' went on the man. Five leagues? Ah! Why do you say ah?' The man bent down once more, was silent for a moment with his eyes fixed on the wheel. Then he rose erect and said, "'Because, though this wheel has traveled five leagues, it certainly will not travel another quarter of a league.' He sprang out of the tilbury. "'What is that you say, my friend? I say that it is a miracle that you should have traveled five leagues without you and your horse rolling into some ditch on the highway. Just see here.' The wheel really had suffered serious damage. The shock administered by the mail wagon had split two spokes and strained the hub, so that the nut no longer held firm. "'My friend,' he said to the stableman, "'is there a wheel right here?' "'Certainly, sir. Do me the service to go and fetch him. He is only a step from here. Hey, Master Bourgaillard!' Master Bourgaillard, the wheelwright, was standing on his own threshold. He came, examined the wheel, and made a grimace like a surgeon when the latter thinks a limb is broken. Can you repair this wheel immediately? Yes, sir. When can I set out again? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? There is a long day's work on it. Are you in a hurry, sir? In a very great hurry. I must set out again in an hour at the latest. Impossible, sir. I will pay whatever you ask. Impossible. Well, in two hours, then. Impossible today. Two new spokes and a hub must be made. Monsieur will not be able to start before tomorrow morning. The matter cannot wait until tomorrow. What if you were to replace this wheel instead of repairing it? How so? You are a wheelwright? Certainly, sir. Have you not a wheel that you can sell me? Then I could start again at once. A spare wheel? Yes. I have no wheel on hand that would fit your cabriolet. Two wheels make a pair. Two wheels cannot be put together haphazard. In that case, sell me a pair of wheels. Not all wheels fit all axles, sir. Try, nevertheless. It is useless, sir. I have nothing to sell but cartwheels. We are but a poor country here. Have you a cabriolet that you can let me have? The wheelwright had seen at the first glance that the Tilbury was a hired vehicle. He shrugged his shoulders. You treat the cabriolets that people let you so well. If I had one, I would not let it to you. Well, sell it to me, then. I have none. What, not even a spring cart? I am not hard to please, as you see. We live in a poor country. There is, in truth, added the wheelwright, an old calash under the shed yonder which belongs to a bourgeois of the town, who gave it to me to take care of, and who only uses it on the thirty-sixth of the month. Never, that is to say. I might let that to you, for what matters it to me? But the bourgeois must not see it pass, and then it is a calash. It would require two horses. I will take two post-horses. Where is monsieur going? To Arras. And monsieur wishes to reach there today? Yes, of course. By taking two post-horses? Why not? Does it make any difference whether monsieur arrives at four o'clock tomorrow morning? Certainly not. There is one thing to be said about that, you see. By taking post-horses... Monsieur has his passport? Yes. Well, by taking post-horses, monsieur cannot reach Arras before tomorrow. We are on a crossroad. The relays are badly served. The horses are in the fields. The season for ploughing is just beginning. Heavy teams are required, and horses are seized upon everywhere, from the post as well as elsewhere. Monsieur will have to wait three or four hours, at the least, every relay. And then they drive at a walk. There are many hills to ascend. Come, then, I will go on horseback. Unharness the cabriolet. Someone can surely sell me a saddle in the neighborhood. Without doubt. But will this horse bear the saddle? That is true, you remind me of that. He will not bear it. Then, but I can surely hire a horse in the village. A horse to travel at Arras in one stretch? Yes. That would require such a horse as does not exist in these parts. You would have to buy it to begin with, because no one knows you. But you will not find one for sale nor to let for five hundred francs, or for a thousand. What am I to do? 
The best thing is to let me repair the wheel like an honest man, and set it on your journey to-morrow. To-morrow will be too late. The deuce! Is there not a mail-wagon which runs to Arras? When will it pass? To-night. Both the posts pass at night, the one going as well as the one coming. What? It will take you a day to mend this wheel? A day, and a good long one. If you set two men to work? If I set ten men to work. What if the spokes were to be tied together with ropes? That could be done with the spokes, not with the hub. And the felly is in a bad state, too. Is there any one in this village who lets out teams? No. Is there another wheelwright? The stableman and the wheelwright replied in concert with a toss of the head. No. He felt an immense joy. It was evident that Providence was intervening, that it was it who had broken the wheel of the Tilbury and who was stopping him on the road. He had not yielded to this sort of first summons. He had just made every possible effort to continue the journey. He had loyally and scrupulously exhausted all means. He had been deterred neither by the season, nor fatigue, nor by the expense. He had nothing with which to reproach himself. If he went no further, that was no fault of his. It did not concern him further. It was no longer his fault. It was not the act of his own conscience, but the act of providence. He breathed again. He breathed freely and to the full extent of his lungs for the first time since Javert's visit. It seemed to him that the hand of iron which had held his heart in its grasp for the past twenty hours had just released him. It seemed to him that God was for him now, and was manifesting himself. He said himself that he had done all he could, and that now he had nothing to do but retrace his steps quietly. If his conversation with the wheelwright had taken place in a chamber of the inn, it would have had no witnesses. No one would have heard him. Things would have rested there, and it is probable that we should not have had to relate any of the occurrences which the reader is about to peruse. But this conversation had taken place in the street. Any colloquy in the street inevitably attracts a crowd. There are always people who ask nothing better than to become spectators. While he was questioning the wheelwright, some people who were passing back and forth halted around them. After listening for a few minutes, a young lad, to whom no one had paid any heed, detached himself from the group and ran off. At the moment when the traveller, after the inward deliberation which we have just described, resolved to retrace his steps, this child returned. He was accompanied by an old woman. Monsieur, said the woman, my boy tells me that you wish to hire a cabriolet. These simple words, uttered by an old woman, led by a child, made the perspiration trickle down his limbs. He thought that he beheld the hand which had relaxed its grasp reappear in the darkness behind him, ready to seize him once more. He answered, Yes, my good woman, I am in search of a cabriolet which I can hire. And he hastened to add, But there is none in the place. Certainly there is, said the old woman. Where? interpolated the wheelwright. At my house, replied the old woman. He shuddered. The fatal hand had grasped him again. The old woman really had in her shed a sort of basket spring cart. The wheelwright and the stableman, in despair at the prospect of the traveller escaping their clutches, interfered. It was a frightful old trap. It rests flat on the axle. It is an actual fact that the seats were suspended inside it by leather thongs. The rain came into it. The wheels were rusted and eaten with moisture. It would not go much further than the Tilbury. A regular ramshackle old stage wagon. The gentleman would make a great mistake if he trusted himself to it etc., etc. All this was true, but this trap, this ramshackle old vehicle, this thing, whatever it was, ran on its two wheels and could go to Arras. He paid what was asked, left the Tilbury with the wheelwright to be repaired, intending to reclaim it on his return, had the white horse put to the cart, climbed into it, and resumed the road which he had been travelling since morning. At the moment when the cart moved off, he admitted that he had felt a moment previously a certain joy in the thought that he should not go whither he was now proceeding. He examined this joy with a sort of wrath and found it absurd. Why should he feel joy at turning back? After all, he was taking this trip of his own free will. No one was forcing him to it. And assuredly nothing would happen except what he should choose. As he left Hesden, he heard a voice shouting to him, Stop! Stop! He halted the cart with a vigorous movement which contained a feverish and convulsive element resembling hope. It was the old woman's little boy. Monsieur, said the latter, it was I who got the cart for you. Well, you have not given me anything. He who gave to all so readily 
thought this demand exorbitant and almost odious. "'Ah, it's you, you scamp,' said he. "'You shall have nothing.' He whipped up his horse and set off at full speed. He had lost a great deal of time at Hesden. He wanted to make it good. The little horse was courageous and pulled for two, but it was the month of February. There had been rain, the roads were bad, and then it was no longer the Tilbury. The cart was very heavy, and in addition there were many ascents. He took nearly four hours to go from Hesden to St. Paul, four hours for five leagues. At St. Paul he had the horse unharnessed at the first inn he came to, and led to the stable, as he had promised Scaufler. He stood beside the manger while the horse was eating. He thought of sad and confusing things. The innkeeper's wife came to the stable. Does not monsieur wish to breakfast? Come, that is true. I even have a good appetite. He followed the woman who had a rosy, cheerful face. She led him to the public room where there were tables covered with waxed cloth. Make haste, said he. I must start again. I am in a hurry. A big Flemish servant-maid placed his knife and fork in all haste. He looked at the girl with a sensation of comfort. That is what ailed me, he thought. I had not breakfasted. His breakfast was served. He seized the bread, took a mouthful, and then slowly replaced it on the table, and did not touch it again. A carter was eating at another table. He said to this man, Why is their bread so bitter here? The carter was a German, and did not understand him. He returned to the stable and remained near the horse. An hour later he had quitted St. Paul and was directing his course towards Tank, which is only five leagues from Arras. What did he do during this journey? Of what was he thinking? As in the morning he watched the trees, the thatched roofs, the tilled fields pass by, and the way in which the landscape, broken at every turn of the road, vanished. This is a sort of contemplation which sometimes suffices to the soul, and almost relieves it from thought. What is more melancholy and more profound than to see a thousand objects for the first and last time? To travel is to be born and to die at every instant. Perhaps, in the vaguest region of his mind, he did make comparisons between the shifting horizon and our human existence. All the things of life are perpetually fleeing before us. The dark and bright intervals are intermingled. After a dazzling moment, an eclipse, we look, we hasten, we stretch out our hands to grasp what is passing. Each event is a turn in the road, and all at once we are old. We feel a shock, all is black. We distinguish an obscure door, the gloomy horse of life which has been drawing us halts, and we see a veiled and unknown person unharnessing amid the shadows. Twilight was falling when the children who were coming out of school beheld this traveller enter Tank. It is true that the days were still short, he did not halt at Tank. As he emerged from the village, a laborer, who was mending the road with stones, raised his head and said to him, "'That horse is very much fatigued.' The poor beast was, in fact, going at a walk. "'Are you going to Arras?' added the road-mender. "'Yes.' "'If you go on at that rate, you will not arrive very early.' He stopped his horse and asked the laborer, "'How far is it from here to Arras?' "'Nearly seven good leagues.' How is that? The posting guide only says five leagues and a quarter. Ah, returned the road-mender, so you don't know that the road is under repair. You will find it barred a quarter of an hour further on. There is no way to proceed further. Really? You will take the road on the left, leading to Carency. You will cross the river. When you reach Camlin, you will turn to the right. That is the road to Mont saint aloy which leads to Arras. But it is night, and I shall lose my way. You do not belong in these parts? No. "'And besides, it is all crossroads. "'Stop, sir,' resumed the road-mender. "'Shall I give you a piece of advice? "'Your horse is tired. "'Return to Tank. "'There is a good inn there. "'Sleep there. "'You can reach your ass to-morrow. "'I must be there this evening. "'That is different, but go to the inn all the same "'and get an extra horse. "'The stable-boy will guide you through the crossroads.' "'He followed the road-mender's advice, "'retraced his steps, "'and half an hour later he passed the same spot again, "'but this time at full speed with a good horse to aid. A stable-boy, who called himself a postillion, was seated on the shaft of the carriole. Still, he felt that he had lost time. Night had fully come. They turned into the crossroad. The way became frightfully bad. The cart lurched from one rut to the other. He said to the postillion, Keep it a trot, and you shall have a double fee. In one of the jolts, the whiffle-tree broke. There's the whiffle-tree broken, sir, said the postillion. I don't know how to harness my horse now. This road is very bad at night. If you wish to return and sleep at Tank, we could be in Arras early tomorrow morning. He replied, 
Have you a bit of rope and a knife? Yes, sir. He cut a branch from a tree and made a whiffle tree of it. This caused another loss of twenty minutes, but they set out again at a gallop. The plain was gloomy. Low-hanging, black, crisp fogs crept over the hills and wrenched themselves away like smoke. There were whitish gleams in the clouds. A strong breeze which blew in from the sea produced a sound in all quarters of the horizon, as of someone moving furniture. Everything that could be seen assumed attitudes of terror. How many things shiver beneath these vast breaths of the night! He was stiff with cold. He had eaten nothing since the night before. He vaguely recalled his other nocturnal trip in the vast plain in the neighborhood of Dang, eight years previously, and it seemed but yesterday. The hour struck from a distant tower. He asked the boy, "'What time is it?' Seven o'clock, sir. We shall reach Arras at eight. We have but three leagues still to go.' At that moment he for the first time indulged in this reflection, thinking it odd the while that it had not occurred to him sooner, that all this trouble which he was taking was perhaps useless, that he did not know so much as the hour of the trial, that he should at least have informed himself of that that he was foolish to go thus straight ahead without knowing whether he would be of any service or not. Then he sketched out some calculations in his mind that, ordinarily, the sittings of the Court of Assizes began at nine o'clock in the morning, that it could not be a long affair, that the theft of the apples would be very brief, that there would then remain only a question of identity, four or five depositions, and very little for the lawyers to say, that he should arrive after all was over. The postillion whipped up the horses, they had crossed the river, and left Mont saint Aloy behind them. The night grew more profound. End of Book 7, Chapter 5